work. But first, the Consumer Product Safety Commission says drownings usually spike during the summer, but these accidents are preventable. Here are some simple reminders. The unmistakable sound of summer. Kids playing in the pool. But without proper attention, fun can quickly take a tragic turn. On average, more than 900 kids die each year from drowning in the U.S. Drowning is the leading cause of unintentional death among kids ages one to four. And it's not just pools you need to be worried about. Ponds like this and other natural bodies of water can also lure kids. So we brought in Mary O'Donoghue. She's the senior aquatics director at the YMCA to talk to us about some basic summer safety tips. It takes as little as 20 seconds for someone to go under the water and not be able to get back to the surface. There are some basic tips that you can evaluate uh, how your children are comfortable in the water. Okay, I have my three girls waiting, eager to get into the pool, so let's go. We are all suited up, ready to go. Emmy and Odessa, they're older, they know how to swim. Renly does not know how to swim yet, and this would be their first swim of the season, so what should we be doing right now? We're gonna look for a Coast Guard approved life jacket for non-swimmers, and you're also looking at the weight category. So this looks like it will fit her. It's 30 to 50 pounds. You want to make sure it fits snugly. How does that feel, Boo? Good. Next, the big girls are up for a quick water competency check. You want to make sure that they can independently submerge in the water. When they come back up, that they can turn around and look to see where the safest place is to get out or grab a hold of and be able to climb out independently. Check to see if they can swim the length of the pool and ask them to tread water for a minute. Lay down. Okay. 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 So Mary, what if you have a child that's not uh, really into being in the pool? And that's fine. Just let them be comfortable in how they are. Sometimes it's just sitting on the wall, putting their feet in, having the uh, Coast Guard approved life jacket on will ensure that if they do get into the water, they're going to be safe. Pool toys are fun, but they can also be dangerous because they block your view of who's in the water. It doesn't look like there are any kids in the water right now, but there are. So make sure you take the pool toys out when you're not using them. It's also important to have a sturdy gate with openings that don't allow little ones to slip through. And you wanna make sure the gate is self-locking. And don't forget kiddie pools and above ground pools. Experts say children can drown in as little as an inch and a half of water. So empty those smaller pools after using them and remove the ladder from larger pools. And no matter what kind of water the kids are in, always designate a water watcher, an adult assigned to watch the kids at all times. Tips to keep your family safe while swimming this summer. Now, even if your child is a good swimmer, fatigue can kick in. So set a timer to remind everyone to take a break and importantly, hydrate. With more on summer safety, NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Vic. So Dr. Azar, let's talk about heat exhaustion. Yes. Let's get an idea of like, what are some of the warning signs we should be watching out for? So the number one thing, Vicki, is that people can either pass out or they have a core body temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. Most of us don't have a digital thermometer on board, so others signs and symptoms to look for would be uh, confusion, headache, lightheadedness, dry skin. People think a lot, well, if you're overheated, you're going to be sweating a lot. Mm. No, people who have heat exhaustion will actually have very red, very hot, very dry skin. That's a very good clue. For. Okay. So if you see someone who is experiencing that, what should you do? So the first thing to do is move them into a cool area. So a shady area under a tree, air conditioning, if you can. We have some props with us yeah. here. If you have the, um, uh, if you're near ice packs, let's say you're at a picnic yeah. or something okay. like that, the places to put them under the neck, under the arm, in the groin, those are areas where a lot of blood vessels, that can start okay. to cool the temperature down. A big misconception is that you put people in an ice bath. Uh -huh. We don't want you doing that unless it was someone who has exertional exhaustion, meaning like a, a, an athlete who did a vigorous workout. Mm -hmm. They can go in an ice tub. Nobody else should go into an ice tub. And call 911. You should actually do that before you start initiating first aid because it is a medical emergency. Okay, that's good to know. So let's talk about prevention. How do you prevent yourself from becoming overheated? Well, it's really about dehydration. Mm -hmm. So obviously, 
daily sun exposure is the big one. And I think people often think, well, I'm just going to drink a lot of water and a lot of fluids, and that certainly can be beneficial. But you can also eat foods that have a lot or a high water content. Yeah. We're talking strawberries, uh -huh. peaches, lettuce in salads, watermelon, yeah. celery, cucumbers. What to avoid? Alcohol is a big one. Alcohol definitely dehydrates. And we have here our good old... Yeah, what about show. coffee? So we did think for a long time that caffeine acted as what's called a diuretic, uh -huh. meaning that it made you pee a lot yes. and that you would lose fluid that way. You really can't dehydrate yourself with caffeinated beverages really? on their own. Right. So if you're drinking an iced coffee, there's a lot of water in there too. So that's you okay. Enjoy your caffeinated beverages, but just keep an, keep an eye on how much you're sweating and how much you're taking it. And make sure you drink more water for alcohol. That's like an important rule, right? <laughs> okay. Alcohol in the sun is just a big no-no. I know. And, but that it mixes a lot during summer. So people got to pay really attention. Does. Let's talk careful. about this, the debate over spray sunscreen versus cream sunscreen. Yes. Is there a difference and is one better than the other? Right. So if you ask, most dermatologists will say the best sunscreen is the sunscreen that you actually apply. Mm. And you know this, mm -hmm. Vic, my kids are a little older now, yeah. but trying to have your fidgety kids stay still to apply lotion is not that easy. Right. So for a lot of us moms and dads out there, it is easier to spray. Okay. Spray is fine as long as the spray is actually getting onto the skin. So be aware of, of wind and that kind of thing. Yeah. I like to apply the spray and then make sure that you rub it in, but it's just as good SPF 30 or above. Okay. Reapply every two hours. Reapply, especially if you're doing vigorous exercise and, and sweating. sweating or mm -hmm. swimming. Every time you come out of the pool, you have to reapply and let it sink in for about 15 or 20 minutes before and you go back in the sun. If you're spraying, make sure you do it outside in a well-ventilated spot. In a, in a well-ventilated spot, yes. Okay, and I want to mention, okay. obviously, you talked about you have we have hats, and of course, that sun protective clothing is important too. Very, and you want to do, generally speaking, like colored light, okay. weight, hats, that kind of thing. If you can look through the piece of clothing, that's not thick enough, oh, right? You want to be able to, it's okay. more like you want it to be more opaque, mm -hmm. light colored and light, but still that you can't see the light through it. Then you know you're pretty well covered. Dr. Natalie Azar, you are the best. Thank you Thank for covering you so sun much safety for having with us. us. Good to see you. All right, well, still to come from grilling to fireworks, hacks to keep your family safe all season long, and later, save or splurge how to stretch your dollars on summer necessities. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Whoa. You deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. You all love Al Roker. favorite holidays, 4th of July, but before you do anything, some must-see safety tips and hacks to make sure everyone has a great time while staying safe. It's the 4th of July, and that means summer. Time to head outside and enjoy the weather. And if you're like me, there will be a lot of grilling happening in your house, but are you using one of these to clean your grates? Well, the metal bristles work great for cleaning, but they can also come out of the brush and get stuck in your food. So here is a fantastic alternative, an onion. Yeah, an onion. 
Check it out. It works really well to get all that gunk off of the grates. And if you don't have an onion, another quick, easy trick, aluminum foil. Just take a ball and get to scrubbing. Also, as you're getting ready to grill that meat, make sure you keep it refrigerated. The USDA says anything that's uncooked left out for more than an hour in this summer weather could make you sick. Serving adult beverages at the party? I like to use two different color cups, red ones for the grown-ups and the alcoholic beverages, blue ones for the kid-friendly drinks. There you go, Aspen. That way, there is no confusion. And it just wouldn't be the 4th of July without fireworks. If you're heading out to a big show, it's gonna be amazing. But one thing's for sure, it's gonna be loud. And if you are bringing your little ones, don't forget the ear protection. I like these ones, they go over the ears just like this. Jay's helping us out. Those feel okay, Jay? Awesome. And if you can't find those in time, well, these work just as well, the traditional earplugs. Now let's talk about the at-home fireworks. So much fun, but they can also be incredibly dangerous. So before you light off those one, two, three goes or the rainbow shower, wow, this brings me back. Make sure you've done your homework. Fire extinguisher at the ready, have it out, know how to use it. And don't forget, sparklers, very fun, but even something as small as this can start a big fire. So have the bucket of water ready and when everything's done, extinguish it and you're safe. And of course, check to see if it's legal to light fireworks where you live. Here's a great tip for when you venture out into the crowds for fireworks. Use a temporary tattoo with your name and phone number so if your child gets lost, someone can call you right away. And you can get this temporary tattoo paper online, print it out at home, that's what I did. You don't have time for that. Permanent marker works just as well. Pool parties are always fun, but here's some tips. Be sure to designate a responsible and sober adult. I'll take that, thank you, to watch the pool. As an additional safety measure, there's a number of high-tech tools that can help you in case of a potential pool safety incident. There's this bracelet by Safety Turtle, and it will sound an alarm the second your kid hits the water. And this is super loud. There's no way you're gonna miss this alarm. And it works for your pets too if your dog is not a strong swimmer, right, Peanut? And you've definitely heard this before, but don't forget about the sunscreen. We apply that sunscreen about every hour. We all have our phones with us all the time. Just set a timer, easy reminder. And a great rule of thumb for exactly how much sunscreen to use, the experts recommend a shot glass full. But really, you can never get too much. And just a reminder, every year animal shelters see an influx of pets who get spooked by the fireworks and run off. So make sure those tags on your pets are updated with your correct phone number and address. And also just keep your pets inside during the fireworks. All right, when we come back, your summer shopping guide, where to find the deals and later how to host the hottest summer get togethers. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Yeah, here we go. Mom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all.
are back with our Consumer Confidential telling you what to buy in the month of June and what you may want to skip to save some money. So here to break it down is our senior investigative and consumer correspondent, Vicki Wynn. Vicki, good morning. Good morning, guys. So they say June is a good time to buy for dads, yes. graduates. Is that true? I First of all, yes, and also, Father's Day is coming up. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. Come on. Father's see, Day. See that that oh, 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 yeah. oh, it's Father's Produce Day. Producer segment. Greeny didn't oh, put that on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what else is modestly priced right now? Okay, we'll talk about dads and grads. Let's start with grads. Craig, you wanted to ask, is cash okay? Cash is always okay. Yes. I think we got to transition you and wean you off of gift cards. And the reason why, there's $21 billion in unused gift cards right now sitting mm -hmm. in American households. $21 cash, billion? Cash always gets spent. $21 billion. The average that. person sitting on $175 in gift cards. Mm -hmm. So if you want to give cash to grads, they're always going to be able to use it. If you have a grad that's really into DIY, summer is the time when everybody's getting out there doing those projects themselves, dads as well. So tools and gadgets tend to go on sale. Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Sears, those are all great places to find all of those little things that you need or a tool set, a tool box this time of year is great. The other thing that goes on sale in June is athletic apparel because mm. January is the big push, new year, new you. June, the weather is great again, yeah. so look for uh, Adidas, Nike, okay. Huma, the typical places, but also lots of deals, buy one, uh, buy more, save more type deals at places like JCPenney and Kohl's on shorts, tank tops, all the things you need for that summer refresh. I hear some people are training for a marathon, so this is a good time for you, Chanel. Oh, there you go, yes. get some new sneakers. And then think about it, you're outside, so first aid supplies, go and check that kit in your car, in your medicine oh, cabinet, make sure everything is, is fresh, up to date, the band-aids are still sticky. Amazon last year had 50% off of band-aids and Neosporin and all that good stuff, so you want the, those things on hand for all right, sunburns so, and bites. So what are some of the big sales, big ticket items going on Okay, this month? so Bath and Body Works, they, they call it the queen of June sales because that's when you get all your lotions, your potions, your soaps out. This is the time to stock up. Body Shop also huh. does a sale up to 75% off oh, Bath wow. and Body Works. And the hack from the crazy coupon lady is if you sign up for the email, you'll get those coupons mailed to you. That's typically a sale that's better to do in store because those items are heavy. So if you have to pay for shipping mm -hmm. or a minimum purchase, you'll get better deals in store. Okay. Uh, right, video Vic games is the next one. 90% right. off of PC games. Uh -oh. Steam and GOG look for deals starting mid-June and late June that go in to July, Humble Bundle and Ubisoft. I think they're trying to get people from outside to come back inside, so oh. this is the time, up to 90% off of those, oh. those computer games. And then Pet Supplies for Pepper and oh. my dog Moose, Chewy has their What's your dog's name? His Moose. His name is Moose. He's, he's little, but you know, big and But scared. mighty. Yeah, tiny but mighty. Um, pet Supplies, Chewy has their huge sale in June, up to 50% off, not just for dogs and cats, fish, reptiles, that guinea okay. pig you've always wanted. Oh, right? yes. And the farm animals as well. All right, finally, are there some items that maybe aren't uh, a good time to buy. I guess they're most affordable at this moment. Yes, you want to hold off. If you haven't gotten your air conditioner for the summer, this is not a great time to get it. They're going to go on sale again July, August, September. Brand name clothing, if you're into it, Nordstrom has its big anniversary sale. Okay. The previews start June 29th, it's, uh, but you want to wait until July 15th because that's when the sale actually kicks in. Mm. For anything that's high-end, brand name, that's when you're going to see the big sales. And then on your bigger ticket Amazon devices. Like Alexa? Like Alexa. Echoes, those kinds Got of it. things. Prime Day is coming, Christmas oh, in July. Right. Trey oh. Bodge, our smart shopping expert, predicts it'll be the second week of July, so don't buy that right now. But if you want to get your dad a tablet or some kind of device, mm -hmm. this could be a good time for Father's All Day. Right. Vicki, thanks so You're much. Welcome. We love our dads. This morning on today's checklist, we are focusing on summer medical travel safety as we enter prime vacation season with all the time and, and energy that we spend planning the actual trip. It's a good idea to prepare for injuries and illnesses as well. So we brought in an expert, Dr. Kavita Agarwal is a board certified in internal medicine. Dr. Kavita, good to have you good back. Good morning. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh -huh. So before we hop on that plane or hop yeah. on that train or hop in the car, you yeah. say that it's a good idea to talk to a, our doctor and our pharmacist. Why? Absolutely, because think about this, you want to have a summer vacation without getting sick, right? We want to have a fun time. So what I would recommend is checking with your doctor first. Okay. And what they can do is just make sure that you're up to date with your routine vaccines, like the flu and the tetanus shot. And then also your childhood vaccines. You want to make sure that you're up to date with your chicken pox and your polio, mumps, measles, rubella, because there are some areas around the world that have pockets of those infections and that way you'll be safe and protected. I'm looking, go ahead. I was gonna say, and also with your pharmacist, you 
can ask for certain kinds of prescriptions? Um, you, they can give you some recommendations, you know, for over-the-counter meds, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I think when you speak with your doctor first, they will review which country you're traveling to, okay. and they will review the CDC's recommendations just to make sure that if there are any infections that are brewing in that pocket of the world, that you are safe. So, like, if you're going to the tropical areas, you may want to take bug spray to prevent mosquito-borne infections mm -hmm. like chikungunya, Zika, dengue, malaria, or even Ooh. antibiotics. All of those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. I'm yes. looking at this next um, uh, this next list here about what kind of documents you need. And I have to be honest, before you travel, things I haven't really thought about, like bringing some of your health documents. Yeah, you so if you have any important health documents, make a copy. It's so easy these days. You have a phone, you can take a picture of it, bring it with you. Um, things such as your COVID vaccine cards or some countries that may still require that. Um, and if you take any regularly prescribed medicines, your doctor can actually prepare a health summary that includes your medical diagnoses, your surgery, right, your medication, Right, in the allergies. language where you go. Yes, yes, not just in English, but in the language of the country that you're traveling to. So right. interesting. Yes, and your doctor can review your meds just to make sure that they're approved in the country you're traveling. I will tell you, if you've ever had to go to the hospital or go to a doctor in an emergency in another yeah. country, I had to do that once. It's scary. It is you don't scary. really have, you think you can just pull out your insurance card. It no, just doesn't work that way. No. So on that note, you say yes. to consider yes. traveler's health insurance. Absolutely, because the insurance that you buy here doesn't really typically cover care abroad. Yeah. And if you buy it, then at least you'll have affordable health care while traveling. And I've also understood that sometimes you might want to, depending on where you're going, you might want to think about evacuation insurance as well because and usually that's covered with your travel insurance mm -hmm. good yeah, good deal absolutely. masks have been some people are wearing them mm -hmm. i've been traveling a lot some people aren't what is your rule with that and some other general rules i think now it becomes a personal decision talk with your doctor about it i think if you have chronic conditions that put you at risk for respiratory illnesses and complications you may want to still wear the mask when you're indoors and in close quarters but people say when you walk on the plane and when you walk off is when you should wear it but when actually you're sitting on the plane because of the filter it's oh actually the filters are really good the air circulation is good it really reduces the risk of infection okay. absolutely. what are some other general rules um, so if you're going on a long journey um, something that is like a very long car plane train ride sitting for prolonged periods can cause your blood to pool in your legs and you could be at higher risk of blood clots so the way to prevent that is get up like every two hours or so mm -hmm. and stretch out those calf muscles go for a walk um, also want to stay hydrated because it's summertime right yeah. you could be out in the sun you're on the beach going for a hike stay hydrated um, skip risky foods mm, um, yeah. if you're going to be in an area where you don't know about the water if it's safe yeah. mm. I say you stick to bottled water mm -hmm. skip the ice we've all been yeah. there oh my yeah. gosh you don't yeah. want to be sick while on vacation <laughs> it's good. Um, wash those hands too. wash those yeah. hands yeah. get right. the street foods on flights I wear a uh, compression socks. oh they help they yeah. help definitely that's, that's yeah, absolutely because well, then I've absolutely. had blood clots yeah. so yeah. what about uh, what are some of the uh, the over-the-counter medicines we should be bringing with us and I definitely recommend taking them from here because once I was in Paris my son got sick we went in and everything's in French and you don't, yeah. don't even know what's yeah. what so it's you want to have meds that you know and are comfortable with so the things that I pack and like to take with me are motion sickness meds your anti-diarrheals your cold and flu meds um, pain All relievers things. cold um, sleep aids you know because mm -hmm. especially in a plane it's very hard yeah. to sleep sure. and if you got a, a red eye you want to be refreshed the next day um, and also going back to the bug spray you want to choose something that is EPA registered and that way you know it works and sunscreen don't yeah. forget the sunscreen. Yeah. And then yeah. This makes your trip a little always. smoother and you know yeah. when you have these things. Yes. Good yes. advice. And also with the over-the-counter meds, the nice thing is that if you're trying to take your carry-on mm -hmm. and not you know bring a checked in luggage, they come in these foil packs that are slim yes. and then you can avoid the liquids and just oh. stick to the tablets so Thank you don't you. get stuck at security. Well coming up, hacks to make the most out of summer from staying cool to being the hostess with the mostess. Consumer Confidential is coming right back.
All right, now that we know how to stay safe and what to buy and when to buy it, let's take things to the next level and make the most of what summer has to offer with hacks for staying cool and how to host the hottest get together. Melanie Berlier, the Spruce Group General Manager, she's here now to help us maximize our summer. Okay, welcome Melanie, I'm gonna bring us over here. Start off with uh, talking to us about these products and how can they help us with our summer plans. There are so many underrated ways to beat the heat this summer. When it comes to energy efficiency, one of the simplest things you can do is swap out all of your old bulbs oh. for the newer ones because they're more energy efficient mm -hmm. and they're not going to emit any heat throughout your home. Nice, so you save money on the bill and they're cooler. What about these devices here? The so the dehumidifier comes in handy because your air conditioning unit is working really, really hard to cool the air and remove moisture from the air. But if you have a dehumidifier oh. on site, the air conditioner isn't going to have to work as hard. Nice, oh, I love that. Okay, and then finally, talk to us about the pillow and sheets here. Sure, so bedding is super important when it comes to your temperature control, mm -hmm. which impacts your quality of sleep. Yes. With a cooling pillow, you're actually going to remove heat from your body and get a better night's rest oh. during like summer. that. Yeah, it's so important to sleep yeah. with a cool pillow. And at the Spruce, we recommend really lightweight, 100% cotton sheets for the summer months. Okay, excellent. All right, my family loves to be outside. We can't wait to get out there, use our backyard. Tell us about different things that we can do to stay cool, stay hydrated, and have a good time. Sure, so a DIY bar cart is one of our favorite oh, things. Oh, that's a great it's idea. So easy to do, and it's a fan favorite. So you just need, in addition to the bar cart, you need a beverage dispenser mm -hmm. to display your batch cocktail of choice. Mm -hmm. You need super durable tumblers. Forget glass outdoors, please. Yeah. It's much safer to go with a durable plastic. And then you're going to want an ice bucket. If you're feeling next level, throw some succulents on there and a bowl of lemons and limes. And staying hydrated is important. So getting a big size, getting everyone the liquids that they need. All right. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about staying safe when you're in the sun. We talked about sunscreen earlier, and I think that's so vital. Yeah. One of our favorite things is that we recommend a sun protection station. Mm. You're going to want to include sun hats, sunglasses, and sun screen that your family members or visitors can choose from. Okay, and then finally the sun goes down, you still want the party to continue. That's kind of the most fun because then it's cooler. Yes. What are some things to help us get through the summer nights? So we love lighting, wicker lanterns, string lights are beautiful, but when it comes to insects, uh -huh. an insect yes. repelling candle is going to do double duty as both a source of warm, cozy vibes and a bug repellent. Okay, and you know what we did? We bought one of those giant outdoor fans, which really helps to keep the bugs away as well. Yes, those are a great idea too. I love this wicker lamp. All right, Melanie, what about outdoor movies? That's becoming more and more popular. Backyard movie theaters are so easy to create and they're fun for literally everyone of all ages. All you need are a screen, mm -hmm. a projector, an audio system, a content source, and a few cables and wires. <laughs> You're like, all you need are these seven things, <laughs> but they're, they're pretty affordable these days, yes? They really are, and aside from the technical, Aspects, all you want to think about are food, seating, and maybe some mosquito netting. But Definitely. Everyone has fun in a backyard movie theater moment. Melanie Berlier, thank you so much. So appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right, well, that is our time for all of us here at NBC News. I'm Vicki Wynn. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. In the meantime, stay safe and cool. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America with interesting architecture, diverse restaurants and specialty shops. It's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other.
Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for con mining boomed. The city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. It's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor and so from Gold Rush, they ended up doing farming, mm -hmm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple rolls of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into, you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. 
we do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, you know, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved Butte, Montana. 
Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They need to have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for you know a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable, so much history and so many memories. You know, a lot of patrons that have been here, they've told me they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism, and that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens 
and low-income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan, and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age, and if it happened to their parents, how would they feel? People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't, we can't do that we changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, people are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, uh, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or an uh, old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate.
To learn more about the future of Chinese-American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, General Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right, because it's all over the United States. Yeah. So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then They go somewhere else, right. To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly, and then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese-American food, many family-owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the wok stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of food and wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusiony and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right. uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. 
Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. yeah. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, Two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Well, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. There's a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the little Chinese sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa. You've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic, and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. Well, hello, welcome to the booth. So happy to see you. With Father's Day arriving this weekend, we're celebrating all the dads out there. And we are gonna start with a Boost exclusive in the latest installment of our series, Dad's Got This. Craig Melvin sat down with the father-son duo bonded by a sport they love. There we go. Stay in it, push. Come on, get in there, get there! Father-son coaching duo that are both named Alonzo Webb. What do I call you? Coach Zoe. Uh, Coach Webb. All the way, DJ. There you go. Stay there. Coach Alonzo Webb started coaching track at the age of 17 and is now finishing up his 51st season. For the last 21 years, he's been the head track and field coach at the University of Pittsburgh. Coach Webb was one of nine children raised by a single mom in Pittsburgh, an experience that later inspired him to take on a fatherly role for his athletes. You know, especially when I was coaching age group track from eight years old through 18, and a lot of them didn't have fathers, you know, in the house. And so I became a father figure to them. When he became a father himself, Coach Webb didn't want to pressure his son, Zoe, into running. And so I told him I wanted to run. And he sat me down and he said, son, you don't, you don't have to. You can pick whatever sport you want. I was shocked at, as a, at five and a half even, like, ah, this is what we do. Zoe picked track and he stuck with it rising to become a collegiate long and high jumper for his dad's team at Pitt. In the back of your, of your mind, did you think, you know what, I could see myself becoming my father one day. We spent a lot of time around each other, you know, my entire life in the sport. Um, and I, I wanted my own identity, I wanted my own thing. But at some point in my senior year, 
Uh, I started helping my teammates out a lot. I thought, I might be able to coach. I might like this thing. After graduation, Zoe quickly volunteered to coach with his dad and was promoted to full-time assistant coach the following season. How'd that feel? The family atmosphere on the team draws talent from around the world. Junior long jumper Ilsa Stegana came from the Netherlands to compete for Pitt. I definitely looked for like a new second family. Coming here to the team, you really feel like you are within a family because like the coaches are related. Um, you feel more connected all together. Coach Zell added to that family when he became a dad to daughter Zara five years ago. Did you find that coaching helps you as a dad as well? Being a coach sometimes, I think you, you see a lot of different types of personalities. Um, you start to learn how other people were, were raised, the, the struggles that they may have, the, the places they couldn't communicate with their parents, and give my child the grace of, she, she might feel this way one day, you know, and, and it really does help me. Don't chop, don't chop. While this father and son duo may have a lot in common, their dress code stands in stark contrast. Coach Webb favoring a suit and tie at every track meet, and the son in more typical athletic gear. What's the backstory? In the summers, you know, when I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old, I would always go to the library, and, and I would just sit there and read for hours books about the Olympic Games, and thought back to all those books that I looked at, and, and I noticed that one thing was glaring the coach would always be at the finish line with a stopwatch and they would have uh, a, a suit jacket on or a, uh, a shirt and tie and i started thinking you know what i want to bring that back and you don't wear a suit oh no <laughs> i'm not as cool as him yeah. and he doesn't pay me enough <laughs> in 2021 the pair hit a career high point when they were both awarded Coach of the Year distinction by the Mid-Atlantic Region. I was the head coach of the year, he was the assistant coach. That was it for me. I mean, that was that was the pinnacle. You know, I said, if I didn't coach another day, I'm happy, you know? What's your favorite part about coaching with Dad? He's always been a support for me, uh, but as associate head coach, like that's my job is to be there for him now, to have his back, it's rewarding. Coming up next, these dads have all the right moves. Meet the group of fathers in the UK who are members of a unique brotherhood, supporting each other and spreading joy through dance. Keir Simmons checked out their moves in person and he even jumped in on one of the routines. It all started as a bit of fun back in 2012 in Brighton on Britain's south coast when seven friends all fathers decided on a surprise performance at their kids' annual street dance show. Paul Jukes is the crew leader and a founding member. Those of us that were in the crew at that time wanted to make our kids proud. That was ultimately the kind of main goal. Um, so you decided to dance? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I know there's probably other ways, right? <laughs> More traditional ways. Their kids loved it, and the Outer Puff Daddy's dance crew took off. Over the years, the group has grown to 15 men, all with regular jobs, from teachers and finance directors to mechanics and chefs, who meet once a week to create content that has become a global sensation. And then the pandemic hit, and my daughter said, Dad, you should get the guys on TikTok, because they're gonna, they're gonna kill it. And it just blew up. Now they are viral legends on social media, with nearly 200,000 followers on TikTok. Beyond dancing, this band of brothers has helped boost their own physical and mental health. One of the things about dancing is when you're doing the same thing at the same time, there's a, there's a connection where you kind of sync up as humans and, 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 and doing that, which, you, which gives you something really special. We've built this culture within us that the moment anyone's got any kind of struggles, they just verbalise it and, yeah, it's very, very beautiful like that. They perform at regular events, raising mental health awareness. So ultimately our message is about trying to break the stigma surrounding mental health, in particular men talking, helping others and encouraging others to put a support network around them um, so that when a crisis point happens, they've got the support group there to help them. Has anyone got teenagers? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can't tell me that teenage 
boys or girls that they're not just a little bit embarrassed as well as kind of proud of you guys? Well, I've been doing it for 10 years, so I think any embarrassment they had has long since passed. Oh, they were probably yeah. embarrassed a little bit at the beginning. They've got over it. But now they, you know, now we're quite popular. I think they think it's kind of cool. Yeah, because it's cool on TikTok. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At their weekly rehearsal, I got the chance to see them in action. Yeah! Wow! Yeah, there Dad! Go. Yeah, Dad! All right. You're an intimidating group, I've got to tell you. I'm standing here feeling a little nervous. All right, let's get you in. Come oh, on. my goodness. Come on. And then yeah, it was weird. my turn to aye, aye. hit the dance floor. Three, four, kick. Down, slide forward. Nice! And what happened and there? Was I supposed to turn? Yeah, sorry, straighten up. Okay. Like, right. like attention to detail already. Yeah, well, I've got good. a mirror. Nice. <laughs> so, kick with the left. Right, three. Kick with four. the left. Kick. Oh, sorry. Down, slide forward. Straighten up. Nice. <laughs> We're going to build on that. One more try. Three, four. Kick, down, slide forward. Kick back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Woo! And now, with music. Some good dance in there, Kier. And we are going to continue our celebration of dads right after the break. as we celebrate all the amazing dads out there. Now, to a dad helping other fathers send their love to their children by putting pen to paper for powerful handwritten letters. Craig Melvin has that story. The first thing that we all have in common is that we have a superpower. And our superpower as a dad is our words. Blake Brewer has a story to share with every dad he meets and it starts with how his life changed in an instant on a family vacation when he was 19. Just me and my dad standing on the beach. We're about to go in, go snorkeling. And he looks down at me with this big smile. And uh, he said, man, I'm glad you're out here with me. And we put on the snorkel gear and headed out in the water. And pretty soon we got to a pretty deep spot. And the current was really strong. And my dad started to struggle. Blake was able to swim his father, Larry Brewer, to shore, but after CPR attempts to save his life were unsuccessful, he was pronounced dead, leaving Blake in a state of shock. I'm back in the condo, and my mom appeared in the doorway, and she said, I found something in your dad's briefcase that I know he was going to give you on this trip. It was a letter from his dad that he'd been working on for months, and the words in it would change the course of Blake's life. Were there lines that stood out to you that still stand out to you? My dad wrote, as you're being faithful to the Bible, you're often gonna find yourself in the minority. 
but I assure you that in heaven, you'll be in the majority. Love your dear old dad. That line influenced Blake to follow a path into ministry and in 2020 to start an organization called the Legacy Letter Challenge with the goal of helping one million dads write a letter to their child like the one he had received from his dad. But if you could have one line repeating over and over and over again in their mind, what would it be? That would be your legacy line, and I recommend putting it last. At letter writing workshops like this recent one in Northwest Arkansas, Blake shares his mission and teaches dads how to make an impact with their own letters. Jarrett McClellan was one of the dads taking notes. They hear so much of our voice throughout their whole life that it sounds like a clanging bell sometimes. And when we have an opportunity to write a letter, it's out of the everyday norm. What are some of the concepts the dad should keep in mind when they're writing these letters? I love you and it's unconditional. I'm proud of you, not for what you've done. I'm proud of you for who you are and I believe in you. And as dads, like we see the potential that our children could be. Yeah. And it can be frustrating at times when they're like making mistakes, but we're never gonna shame our children into who they could be. Now that he's a father, Blake challenged himself to write a letter to his kids a couple years ago. And when you read them the letter, did they react? Yeah, so I decided to go ahead and read my uh, four-year-old her letter. And, you know, each night I'm you know, trying to read her a book or a princess book or something. And then that night I said, hey, daddy's got something for you. I am boohooing through this letter. And so I get to the end of the letter and I, I look up at her and she looks at me and she says, uh, daddy, can you read me the princess book now? <laughs> <laughs> but the next night uh, she went up to my wife and she said, last night, daddy read me a message. Can he read me that message again tonight? Wow. So far, Blake has helped thousands of dads write legacy letters to their children through his online and in-person letter writing classes. And he's still hoping to reach and surpass his goal of one million meaningful letters. Yes, it's about the, the son or the daughter that gets the letter. But it seems to me that it's, it's just as much about the dad that's writing the letter. I tell dads as you're writing this letter, like it's for you and your family but each letter does honor my dad's legacy. If he had known when he had written that letter, the impact that it would have on my life, but now the impact that it's having on so many other people's lives. That's faithful. Yeah. Coming up next, a father and son side by side on an incredible journey. Meet the dad making a remarkable recovery after a motorcycle accident with the help of his stepson. Here's Peter Alexander. One, perfect. Two. Deep in the woods of Western Maryland. One last one, make it count. A show of strength. And one more for the road. And a son's nice. love for his dad. That's great, man. <laughs> so, Scott, who's that? Legally, he's my stepson, but he feels like blood to me. Theirs is an unbreakable bond built over years, but cemented by tragedy. Just 19 months ago, Scott Spinelli was cruising down this country road on his motorcycle, a ride that would change everything. I'm rolling down there, not a cloud in the sky. Another driver turned right in front of Scott. He slammed into her windshield, the force of the crash, throwing him 80 feet. His Harley destroyed his life hanging by a thread when his son Grant Taylor's phone rang. How did you find out about the accident? I got a call from a random number. He said, hey, look, uh, your dad just got in a motorcycle accident. He's not going to survive. Uh, your mom's hysterical right now. It'd probably be best if you come get her. Scott was airlifted to a trauma center in Baltimore. After surviving tours in Afghanistan and Iraq, receiving a bronze star for heroism, this Army veteran was in a coma, his leg shattered and his spinal cord fractured. The next day, doctors called on Grant to make a choice. There's not a good chance that you know, your father's gonna live, but that leg needs to go, what's your decision? It was a very hard decision for me and my mom to make, just in a blink. It's like, yep, he would, he would be okay with that. Scott was in that medically induced coma for five days. Grant's dad, his hero, was paralyzed from the waist down, told he would never walk again. Suffering 
does two things. It, it either breaks you down and it kills you or it makes something of you. A lot of people don't realize that growth can come from that, is that you're not buried, you're planted. When you woke up from the medically induced coma, what was the first thing you said to him? All you need is grit and love. How did those words change your life? The words grit grabbed onto me and it hit me deep. Grit is a different perception of life. It's grind, grit, and grace. And being able to have that grit is uh, being able to just take that other step forward. While Scott was away for months of grueling rehab, Grant transformed his parents' home for his family's new reality. But he wasn't finished. Motivated to help his dad heal, Grant left his job as an event coordinator to become a certified personal trainer at Lifetime Fitness. Grant built a gym for his dad in their basement. They had one shared goal, a chance to disprove any doubters. You're never gonna walk again, and I'm like... <laughs> Watch me. Watch me walk. They battled at it together for months. We gotta walk, man. We gotta walk. Then, a breakthrough. It was something as though it was a miracle. He looked at me and his face is red and he's concentrating. I see a tear rolling down his eye and he moved his leg. And on this day with our cameras rolling, Scott eyes. did it again. He did it. You know, talking about not getting it done, we got it done. And we continue to get that done. I love you a lot. And they said it. For this father and son, grit was no longer just a word but a motto. He told me, son, grit's all you need. Grit's all you need. Yeah, and I took it to heart. Um, I got a tattooed on me to the day that he said it to remind myself every day of what I have to keep on going and my purpose and my reason, and also that we're in this together. Coming up, a little dad bonding with some of our favorite dads, Al, Craig, and Carson. Do not miss it. It's right after the break. boost as we head into the father's day weekend it's time for one of our very favorite annual traditions the today dads getting together to reflect on fatherhood and of course have a little fun check it out here we are here we are guys coney That's island. tradition continues you've been yeah. to coney island a lot I, you know i came here when i was literally this was it, 63 years ago this is a, a place we're families come. Yeah. I think there's no better place to talk about being fathers and yeah. yep. uh, without our children. <laughs> <laughs> the Coney Island Boardwalk and Luna Park Amusement Park have been an iconic part of New York City summers for more than 130 years. And the infamous Cyclone Roller Coaster has been terrifying beachgoers for almost that long. And today, that includes us. 
All right, guys, here we are at the famous Cyclone That's roller coaster, it. which the warning sign says any person with a back, neck, or heart problems should not ride the ride. That's me. So let me walk you down <laughs> to oh, your, your lovely Great. seats here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are we secure? Okay, they'll, they'll, they'll take care of that. I don't know. Have you ever been in a wooden roller coaster before? No, honestly, I have not. Oh, really? Never. Oh, well, you're in for a treat. You know those smooth, uh, beautiful, tubular roller yeah. coasters? That, this is not that. Oh. See, Daly, tell the world our story. All right. All right good luck. Good luck, boy. Do you feel yeah. it rocking and oh, back and forth? Oh, this is... oh, now it comes the ratcheting part. Oh, okay. Here we go. Get ready, baby. Don't you this scream. is it. Look oh, at God. that view. Oh, God. Here we go. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, baby, that's a roller coaster. Craig's looking a little green. Oh, oh, oh. How was it? Oh, that's good. Man, I, got, I mean, you don't really expect a 100-year roller coaster to pack that kind of punch. Woo! All right, I'm glad we did that. <laughs> All right, let's go play some games, something yeah, simple. good idea. Yeah. Something a little easier. Why, yes, of course. Boardwalk game, simple, classic, easy, or not. Hey, guys, you guys want to play? Yeah. Sure. Let's do it. All right, let's go, Uncle let's go Al. Out. Let's go, Al. Let's go, Al. Come on, now. Oh, oh just a bit low. Oh, 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 oh. All right. Hey. I'm worried about this one. Oh, oh that's that's just as bad as me. <laughs> oh, oh my at God. least I knocked one down. Oh, one. All right, come on, Carson. Come on, Carson. Okay. Oh, here wow. we go. Your back's yes. Your back's just one. fine. Oh, you guys did a lot better than we did. Oh, can, can he have that one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. I love it. Oh, wow. All right, let's go. Let's, let's go. Roll. Congratulations, well, guys. Woo! Our last stop of the day, Coney Island's own Brooklyn Cyclones Baseball Stadium. Oh, I like the sound. Oh, the oh yeah, this is it. Oh, hey, oh, that's look at the this. magical door. Wow. Oh, this is pretty cool. Wow. See, Daly, what position did you play? Left out. <laughs> <laughs> I was terrible at baseball. Did you play? Second base. Yeah. I was, really? about, I was about as good as you. Yeah. Well, as... from the way you threw that beanbag. Wow. 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 Right, Carson Daly. I didn't think baseball little, was a little throwback to, the to earlier in the piece. Yeah, it was good. I like that. that. Very impressive. You're welcome. This is one of my favorite traditions, fellas. I know. Just sitting around. Baseball? Well, no. <laughs> well, that too. Talking, talking about fatherhood. Yeah. How's nice. the last year been as a, uh, as a dad since we did this? It's been good. It's been great. I mean, um, my two-year-old now is really coming into her own. It's becoming like a little person. Uh, my girls have been into theater and singing and dancing. And Jackson just graduated from seventh grade. And it's, just, it all, it's all happening so fast. It's been a heck of a year. Dell's eight now. And I was able to, to coach his basketball team. You know, he's... That. And I got to see up close, like the kind of man he's becoming. And Sibby's, uh, you know, she just she graduated from preschool yesterday. Yeah. So now she'll start kindergarten. One of the big changes since last year is that my both of my children have become aware of race. Mm. But now, how are they aware of it? What's an example? There was some sort of conversation going on in the house, and Sibby said to my son, who's darker than she is, Sibby's like, "Well, Bill, you're you're black, like Daddy, and I'm I'm white like Mommy." And in the moment, I was like, you know, I'm kind of proud that up until now, they had no idea. Yeah. And we talked about race and being biracial, uh, how the world is going to view you versus how you're you know, viewed in this, in this house. Mm -hmm. uh, but it led to a nice teachable moment. You know, it's funny, I, you know, it's no secret. I had that bout with prostate cancer and it was the first time I saw fear in my children's eyes. Mm. You know, they, I mean, they started crying. At the end of the day, that's all you want to do is protect them right. and, and shield them from hurt and or harm. Yep. And at that moment I realized, you know, you can't always do that, but you can do the best you can. And that's what I know our fathers did. Yep. Uh, and that's all we can do. And I'm 48, my dad died when he was 46. I was five when he died. Think about that, you know, the going through chemo, the hiding it from us, you know, we didn't really even know. 
all the days the doctor calls, the, how scared he must have been, my mom going through this with young kids, and yet our childhood seems so normal. And I think about that now, to your point, yeah. as I get older, I'm just like, you know that company that I think they make t-shirts says like, no bad days? Right. Like I have to constantly remind, like, no bad days. No bad days. Yeah. No bad days ever, considering, you know, what my family went through. That's right. You keep saying that. It makes me sad. I think, guys, I think they're calling me in for relief. Is that what that is? Yeah, I just got this. Oh, okay. oh this yeah. That's right. No, you're no, they're, they're, saying, I love you guys. they're saying we're running out of time. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. I love Day. you guys. Love this you. is my favorite thing of the love year. Really is. Love this. Coming up, we will share the latest viral video to boost your day. Stay with us. to the boost. So before we go, we have one more video for you to brighten your day. Take a look. A perfect example of just how far parents will go to do something nice for their kids. So this was the scene inside a popular rap concert in Greece last week. It was wild. This is what it looked like on the outside. So dad is letting his son sit on his shoulder <laughs> so he could see over the concert wall. Oh my gosh. Casually scrolling his phone. Oh my gosh. Uh, his son's taking in all the action. Dad gets a lot of credit. His son isn't a toddler, almost oh a full-grown kid. Anyway, eventually, Dad reaches his limit. He brings his son down, and he gives his aching back. Oh my gosh, where can we send out? That well. is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. You You're know. That. That's it's not even boy. like he evened it out. No. I got a good back doctor for him. Yeah. yeah. The whole thing. Wow. That is love. That is it for today. We hope we were able to start your day off with a little smile. And we want to say a big thank you to all of the incredible dads out there. We celebrate you today and every day. And we will see you tomorrow with more of The Boost on Today All Day. Vicki Wynn, thanks for joining us for Consumer Confidential Summer Safety Edition. Now we're going to talk about keeping safe this summer, but we're also going to tell you how to save on summer essentials. With inflation reaching record levels, we'll give you some tips to make your money work. But first, the Consumer Product Safety Commission says drownings usually spike during the summer, but these accidents are preventable. Here are some simple reminders. The unmistakable sound of summer. Kids playing in the pool. But without proper attention, fun can quickly take a tragic turn. On average, more than 900 kids die each year from drowning in the U.S. Drowning is the leading cause of unintentional death among kids ages 1 to 4. And it's not just pools you need to be worried about. Ponds like this and other natural bodies of water can also lure kids. So we brought in Mary O'Donohue. She's the Senior Aquatics Director at the YMCA to talk to us about some basic summer safety tips. It takes as little as 20 seconds for someone to go under the water and not be able to get back to the surface. There are some basic tips that you can evaluate uh, how your children are comfortable in the water. Okay, I have my three girls waiting, eager to get into the pool, so let's go. 
We are all suited up, ready to go. Emmy and Odessa, they're older, they know how to swim. Renly does not know how to swim yet, and this would be their first swim of the season, so what should we be doing right now? We're gonna look for a Coast Guard approved life jacket for non-swimmers, and you're also looking at the weight category. So this looks like it will fit her, it's 30 to 50 pounds. You wanna make sure it fits snugly. How does that feel, Boo? Good? Next, the big girls are up for a quick water competency check. You want to make sure that they can independently submerge in the water. When they come back up, that they can turn around and look to see where the safest place is to get out or grab a hold of and be able to climb out independently. Check to see if they can swim the length of the pool and ask them to tread water for a minute. that's not uh, really into being in the pool. And that's fine. Just let them be comfortable in how they are. Sometimes it's just sitting on the wall, putting their feet in, having the uh, Coast Guard approved life jacket on will ensure that if they do get into the water, they're going to be safe. Pool toys are fun, but they can also be dangerous because they block your view of who's in the water. It doesn't look like there are any kids in the water right now, but there are. So make sure you take the pool toys out when you're not using them. It's also important to have a sturdy gate with openings that don't allow little ones to slip through and you wanna make sure the gate is self-locking. And don't forget kiddie pools and above ground pools. Experts say children can drown in as little as an inch and a half of water. So empty those smaller pools after using them and remove the ladder from larger pools. And no matter what kind of water the kids are in, always designate a water watcher, an adult assigned to watch the kids at all times. Tips to keep your family safe while swimming this summer. Now, even if your child is a good swimmer, fatigue can kick in. So set a timer to remind everyone to take a break and importantly, hydrate. With more on summer safety, NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar joins us now. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Beth. So Dr. Azar, let's talk about heat exhaustion. Yes. Let's get an idea of like, what are some of the warning signs we should be watching out for? So the number one thing, Vicki, is that people can either pass out or they have a core body temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. Most of us don't have a digital thermometer on board, so others signs and symptoms to look for would be uh, confusion, headache, lightheadedness, dry skin. People think a lot, well, if you're overheated, you're going to be sweating a lot. Mm. No, people who have heat exhaustion will actually have very red, very hot, very dry skin. That's a very good clue. For. Okay, so if you see someone who is experiencing that, what should you do? So the first thing to do is move them into a cool area. So a shady area under a tree, air conditioning if you can. We have some props with us yeah. here. If you have the, um, uh, if you're near ice packs, let's say you're at a picnic yeah. or something okay. like that, the places to put them under the neck, under the arm, in the groin, those are areas where a lot of blood vessels, that can start okay. to cool the temperature down. A big misconception is that you put people in an ice bath. Uh -huh. We don't want you doing that unless it was someone who has exertional exhaustion, meaning like a, a, an athlete who did a vigorous workout. Mm -hmm. They can go in an ice tub. Nobody else should go into an ice tub. And call 911. You should actually do that before you start initiating first aid because it is a medical emergency. Okay, that's good to know. So let's talk about prevention. How do you prevent yourself from becoming overheated? Well, it's really about dehydration. Mm -hmm. So obviously, sun exposure is the big one. And I think people often think, well, I'm just going to drink a lot of water and a lot of fluids, and that certainly can be beneficial. But you can also eat foods that have a lot or a high water content. Yeah. We're talking strawberries, uh -huh. peaches, lettuce in salads, watermelon, yeah. celery, cucumbers. What to avoid? Alcohol is a big one. Alcohol definitely dehydrates. And we have here our good old... Yeah, what about show. coffee? So we did think for a long time that caffeine acted as what's called a diuretic. Uh -huh meaning that it made you pee a lot yes. and that you would lose fluid that way. You really can't dehydrate yourself with caffeinated beverages really? on their own. Right. So if you're drinking an iced coffee, there's a lot of water in there too. So that's you okay. Enjoy your caffeinated beverages, but just keep an, keep an eye on how much you're sweating and how much you're taking it. And make sure you drink more water for alcohol. That's like an important rule, right? <laughs> okay. Alcohol in the sun is just a big no-no. I know. And, but that it mixes a lot during the summer. So people got to pay really attention. Does. Let's talk about this, the debate over spray sunscreen versus 
versus cream sunscreen. Yes. Is there a difference and is one better than the other? Right. So if you ask, most dermatologists will say the best sunscreen is the sunscreen that you actually apply. Mm. And you know this, mm -hmm. Vic, my kids are a little older now, yeah. but trying to have your fidgety kids stay still to apply lotion is not that easy. Right. So for a lot of us moms and dads out there, it is easier to spray. Okay. Spray is fine as long as the spray is actually getting onto the skin. So be aware of, of wind and that kind of thing. Yeah. I like to apply the spray and then make sure that you rub it in, but it's just as good SPF 30 or above. Okay. Reapply every two hours. Reapply, especially if you're doing vigorous exercise and, and sweating. sweating or mm -hmm. swimming. Every time you come out of the pool, you have to reapply and let it sink in for about 15 or 20 minutes before and you go back in the sun. If you're spraying, make sure you do it outside in a well-ventilated spot. In a, in a well-ventilated spot, yes. Okay, and I want to mention, obviously, you talked about you have we have hats, and of course, that sun protective clothing is important too. Very, and we want to do, generally speaking, like colored light, okay. weight, hats, that kind of thing. If you can look through the piece of clothing, that's not thick enough, oh, right? You want to be able it's, it's okay. more like you want it to be more opaque, mm -hmm. light colored and light, but still that you can't see the light through it. Then you know you're pretty well covered. Dr. Natalie Azar, you are the best. Thank you Thank for covering you so sun much safety for having with us. us. Good to see you. All right, well, still to come from grilling to fireworks, hacks to keep your family safe all season long, and later, save or splurge how to stretch your dollars on summer necessities. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Good morning, everybody. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. Whoa. You deserve to be celebrated. Way to go, Reynolds. Oh, Al. Al, you're all of our heroes. Yeah. Y'all love Al Roker. favorite holidays, 4th of July, but before you do anything, some must-see safety tips and hacks to make sure everyone has a great time while staying safe. It's the 4th of July, and that means summer. Time to head outside and enjoy the weather. And if you're like me, there will be a lot of grilling happening in your house, but are you using one of these to clean your grates? Well, the metal bristles work great for cleaning, but they can also come out of the brush and get stuck in your food. So here is a fantastic alternative, an onion. Yeah, an onion, check it out. It works really well to get all that gunk off of the grates. And if you don't have an onion, another quick, easy trick, aluminum foil. Just take a ball and get to scrubbing. Also, as you're getting ready to grill that meat, make sure you keep it refrigerated. The USDA says anything that's uncooked, left out for more than an hour in this summer weather could make you sick. Serving adult beverages at the party? I like to use two different color cups, red ones for the grown-ups and the alcoholic beverages, blue ones for the kid-friendly drinks. There you go, ask me. That way, there is no confusion. And it just wouldn't be the 4th of July without fireworks. If you're heading out to a big show, it's gonna be amazing. But one thing's for sure, it's gonna be loud. And if you are bringing your little ones, don't forget the ear protection. I like these ones, they go over the ears just like this. Jay's helping us out. Those feel okay, Jay? Awesome. 
And if you can't find those in time, well, these work just as well, the traditional earplugs. Now let's talk about the at-home fireworks. So much fun, but they can also be incredibly dangerous. So before you light off those one, two, three goes or the rainbow shower, wow, this brings me back. Make sure you've done your homework. Fire extinguisher at the ready, have it out, know how to use it. And don't forget, sparklers, very fun, but even something as small as this can start a big fire. So have the bucket of water ready and when everything's done, extinguish it and you're safe. And of course, check to see if it's legal to light fireworks where you live. Here's a great tip for when you venture out into the crowds for fireworks. Use a temporary tattoo with your name and phone number so if your child gets lost, someone can call you right away. And you can get this temporary tattoo paper online, print it out at home, that's what I did. You don't have time for that. Permanent marker works just as well. Pool parties are always fun, but here's some tips. Be sure to designate a responsible and sober adult. I'll take that, thank you, to watch the pool. As an additional safety measure, there's a number of high-tech tools that can help you in case of a potential pool safety incident. There's this bracelet by Safety Turtle, and it will sound an alarm the second your kid hits the water. And this is super loud. There's no way you're gonna miss this alarm. And it works for your pets too if your dog is not a strong swimmer, right, Peanut? And you've definitely heard this before, but don't forget about the sunscreen. Reapply that sunscreen about every hour. We all have our phones with us all the time. Just set a timer, easy reminder. And a great rule of thumb for exactly how much sunscreen to use, the experts recommend a shot glass full. But really, you can never get too much. And just a reminder, every year animal shelters see an influx of pets who get spooked by the fireworks and run off. So make sure those tags on your pets are updated with your correct phone number and address. And also just keep your pets inside during the fireworks. All right, when we come back, your summer shopping guide, where to find the deals and later how to host the hottest summer get togethers. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Well, sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. We are back with our Consumer Confidential telling you what to buy in the month of June and what you may want to skip to save some money. So here to break it down is our senior investigative and consumer correspondent, Vicki Wynn. Vicki, good morning. Good morning, guys. So they say June is a good time to buy for dads, yes. graduates. Is that true? I 
first of all. Yeah, and it's also, Father's Day is coming up. Yeah. Oh, oh that's right. Father's Day. See, you see that reaction oh, 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 right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Father's Day. Produce the segment. Greeny didn't oh, put that on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what else is modestly priced right now? Okay, we'll talk about dads and grads. Let's start with grads. Craig, you wanted to ask, is cash okay? Cash is always okay. Yes. I think we got to transition you and wean you off of gift cards. And the reason why, there's $21 billion in unused gift cards right now sitting mm. in American households. $21 cash, billion? Cash always gets spent. $21 billion. The average that. person sitting on $175 in gift cards. Mm -hmm. So if you want to give cash to grads, they're always going to be able to use it. If you have a grad that's really into DIY, summer is the time when everybody's getting out there doing those projects themselves, dads as well. So tools and gadgets tend to go on sale. Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, Sears, those are all great places to find all of those little things that you need or a tool set, a tool box this time of year is great. The other thing that goes on sale in June is athletic apparel because mm. January is the big push, new year, new you. June, the weather is great again, yeah. so look for uh, Adidas, Nike, okay. Puma, the typical places, but also lots of deals, buy one, uh, buy more, save more type deals at places like JCPenney and Kohl's on shorts, tank tops, all the things you need for that summer refresh. I hear some people are training for a marathon. So this is a good time for you, Chanel. Okay. There you go. Yes. Get some new sneakers. And then think about it. You're outside. So first aid supplies, go and check that kit in your car, in your medicine oh, cabinet. Make sure everything is, is fresh, up to date. The band-aids are still sticky. Amazon last year had 50% off of band-aids and Neosporin and all that good stuff. So you want the, those things on hand for right, sunburns so, and bites. So what are some of the big sales, big ticket items going on? Okay. This month? So Bath and Body Works, they, they call it the queen of June sales because that's when you get all your lotions, your potions, your soaps out. This is the time to stock up. Body Shop also huh. does a sale up to 75% off oh, Bath wow. and Body Works. And the hack from the crazy coupon lady is if you sign up for the email, you'll get those coupons mailed to you. That's typically a sale that's better to do in store because those items are heavy. So if you have to pay for shipping mm. or a minimum purchase, you'll get better deals in store. Okay. Uh, right, video Vic. games is the next one. 90% right. off of PC games. Oh. Steam and GOG look for deals starting mid-June and late June that go in to July, Humble Bundle and Ubisoft. I think they're trying to get people from outside to come back inside, so oh. this is the time, up to 90% off of those, oh. those computer games. And then pet supplies for Pepper and oh. my dog Moose, Chewy has their What's your dog's name? His Moose. name is Moose. He's, he's little, but you know, big and But mighty. Spirit. Yeah, <laughs> tiny but mighty. Um, pet supplies. Chewy has their huge sale in June, up to 50% off, not just for dogs and cats, fish, reptiles, that guinea okay. pig you've always wanted. Oh, right? yes. And the farm animals as well. All right, finally, are there some items that maybe aren't uh, a good time to buy. I guess they're most affordable at this moment. Yes, you want to hold off. If you haven't gotten your air conditioner for the summer, this is not a great time to get it. They're going to go on sale again July, August, September. Brand name clothing, if you're into it, Nordstrom has its big anniversary sale. Okay. The previews start June 29th, it's, uh, but you want to wait until July 15th because that's when the sale actually kicks in. Mm. For anything that's high-end, brand name, that's when you're going to see the big sales. And then on your bigger ticket Amazon devices. Like Alexa? Like Alexa. Echoes, those kinds Got of it. things. Prime Day is coming, Christmas oh, in July. Right. Trey oh. Bodge, our smart shopping expert, predicts it'll be the second week of July, so don't buy that right now. But if you want to get your dad a tablet or some kind of device, mm -hmm. this could be a good time for Father's All Day. Right. Vicki, thanks so much. We love our dads. This morning on today's checklist, we are focusing on summer medical travel safety as we enter prime vacation season with all the time and, and energy that we spend planning the actual trip. It's a good idea to prepare for injuries and illnesses as well. So we brought in an expert, Dr. Kavita Agarwal is a board certified in internal medicine. Dr. Kavita, good to have you good back. Good morning. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh -huh. So before we hop on that plane or hop yeah. on that train or hop in the car, you yeah. say that it's a good idea to talk to a, our doctor and our pharmacist. Why? Absolutely, because think about this, you want to have a summer vacation without getting sick, right? We want to have a fun time. So what I would recommend is checking with your doctor first. Okay. And what they can do is just make sure that you're up to date with your routine vaccines, like the flu and the tetanus shot. And then also your childhood vaccines. You want to make sure that you're up to date with your chicken pox and your polio, mumps, measles, rubella, because there are some areas around the world that have pockets of those infections, and that way you'll be safe and protected. I'm looking, go ahead. I was going to say, and also with your pharmacist, you 
can ask for certain kinds of prescriptions? Um, you, they can give you some recommendations, you know, for over-the-counter meds, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I think when you speak with your doctor first, they will review which country you're traveling to, okay. and they will review the CDC's recommendations just to make sure that if there are any infections that are brewing in that pocket of the world, that you are safe. So, like, if you're going to the tropical areas, you may want to take bug spray to prevent mosquito-borne infections mm -hmm. like chikungunya, Zika, dengue, malaria, or even Ooh. antibiotics. All of those mm -hmm. things. Yes. I'm looking at this next um, uh, this next list here about what kind of documents you need. And I have to be honest, before you travel, things I haven't really thought about, like bringing some of your health documents. When yeah. You go. So if you have any important health documents, make a copy. It's so easy these days. You have a phone. You can take a picture of it, bring it with you. Um, things such as your COVID vaccine cards, or some countries that may still require that. Um, and if you take any regularly prescribed medicines, your doctor can actually prepare a health summary that includes your medical diagnoses, your surgery, right, in your medications, the, in the allergies. language where you go. Yes, yes, not just in English, but in the language of the country that you're traveling that's to. So right. interesting. Yes, and your doctor can review your meds just to make sure that they're approved in the country you're traveling. I will tell you, if you've ever had to go to the hospital or go to a doctor in an emergency in another yeah. country, I had to do that once. It's scary. It is you don't scary. really have. You think you can just pull out your insurance card? It no, just doesn't work that way. No. So on that note, you say yes. to consider yes. travelers' health insurance. Absolutely, because the insurance that you buy here doesn't really typically cover care abroad. Yeah. And if you buy it, then at least you'll have affordable health care while traveling. And I've also understood that sometimes you might want to, depending on where you're going, you might want to think about evacuation insurance as well. Because and usually that's covered with your travel insurance. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, good deal. Absolutely. Masks have been, some people are wearing them. Mm -hmm. I've been traveling a lot. Some people aren't. What is your rule with that and some other general rules? I think now it becomes a personal decision. Talk with your doctor about it. I think if you have chronic conditions that put you at risk for respiratory illnesses and complications, you may want to still wear the mask when you're indoors and in close quarters. But people say when you walk on the plane and when you walk off is when you should wear it, but when actually you're sitting on the plane because of the filter, it's oh, actually... Oh, the filters are really good. The air circulation is good. It really reduces the risk of infection. Okay. Absolutely. What are some other general rules? Um, so if you're going on a long journey, um, something that is like a very long car, plane, train ride, sitting for prolonged periods can cause your blood to pool in your legs and you could be at higher risk of blood clots. So the way to prevent that is get up like every two hours or so mm -hmm. and stretch out those calf muscles, go for a walk. Um, also want to stay hydrated because it's summertime, right? Yeah. You could be out in the sun, you're on the beach, going for a hike, stay hydrated. Um, skip risky foods. Mm, um, yeah. If you're going to be in an area where you don't know about the water, if it's safe, yeah. mm. I say you stick to bottled water, mm -hmm. skip the ice. We've all been yeah. there. Oh my yeah. gosh, you don't yeah. want to be sick while on vacation. <laughs> it's good. Um, wash those hands. Too. Wash those yeah. hands, yeah. skip right. the street foods. On flights, I wear uh, compression socks. Oh, they help. They yeah. help, definitely. That's, that's yeah, helped absolutely. Out as well, and I've absolutely. had blood clots. Yeah. So, yeah. what about, uh, what are some of the uh, the over-the-counter medicines we should be bringing with us. And I definitely recommend taking them from here because once I was in Paris, my son got sick, we went in and everything's in French and you don't, yeah. don't even right. know what's yeah. what. So it's you want to have meds that you know and are comfortable with. So the things that I pack and like to take with me are motion sickness meds, your anti-diarrheals, your cold and flu meds, um, pain relievers, things. cold um, sleep aids, you know, because mm -hmm. especially on a plane, it's very hard yeah. to sleep. Sure. And if you got a, a red eye, you want to be refreshed the next day. Um, and also going back to the bug spray, you want to choose something that is EPA registered in that way, you know, it works and sunscreen don't yeah. have a sunscreen. Yeah. And yeah. Just makes your trip a little always. smoother, and, you know, yeah. when you have these things. Yes. Good yeah. advice. And also with the over-the-counter meds, the nice thing is that if you're trying to take your carry-on mm -hmm. and not, you know, bring a checked-in luggage, they come in these foil packs that are slim yes. and then you can avoid the liquids and just oh. stick to the tablet so Thank you don't you. get stuck at security. Well, coming up, hacks to make the most out of summer from staying cool to being the hostess with the mostess. Consumer Confidential is coming right back.
All right, now that we know how to stay safe and what to buy and when to buy it, let's take things to the next level and make the most of what summer has to offer with hacks for staying cool and how to host the hottest get together. Melanie Berlier, the Spruce Group General Manager, she's here now to help us maximize our summer. Okay, welcome Melanie, I'm gonna bring us over here. Start off with uh, talking to us about these products and how can they help us with our summer plans. There are so many underrated ways to beat the heat this summer. When it comes to energy efficiency, one of the simplest things you can do is swap out all of your old bulbs oh. for the newer ones because they're more energy efficient mm -hmm. and they're not going to emit any heat throughout your home. Nice, so you save money on the bill and they're cooler. What about these devices here? The so the dehumidifier comes in handy because your air conditioning unit is working really, really hard to cool the air and remove moisture from the air. But if you have a dehumidifier oh. on site, the air conditioner isn't going to have to work as hard. Nice, oh, I love that. Okay, and then finally, talk to us about the pillow and sheets here. Sure, so bedding is super important when it comes to your temperature control, mm -hmm. which impacts your quality of sleep. Yes. With a cooling pillow, you're actually going to remove heat from your body and get a better night's rest oh, during I like that. Yeah, it's so important to sleep yeah. with a cool pillow. And at the Spruce, we recommend really lightweight, 100% cotton sheets for the summer months. Okay, excellent. All right, my family loves to be outside. We can't wait to get out there, use our backyard. Tell us about different things that we can do to stay cool, stay hydrated, and have a good time. Sure, so a DIY bar cart is one of our favorite oh, things. Oh, that's a great it's idea. So easy to do, and it's a fan favorite. So you just need, in addition to the bar cart, you need a beverage dispenser mm -hmm. to display your batch cocktail of choice. Mm -hmm. You need super durable tumblers. Forget glass outdoors, please. Yeah. It's much safer to go with a durable plastic. And then you're gonna want an ice bucket. If you're feeling next level, throw some succulents on there and a bowl of lemons and limes. And staying hydrated is important, so getting a big size, getting everyone the liquids that they need. All right, Absolutely. let's talk a little bit about staying safe when you're in the sun. We talked about sunscreen earlier and I think that's so vital. Yeah, one of our favorite things is that we recommend a sun protection station. Mm. You're gonna want to include sun hats, sunglasses, and sunscreen that your family members or visitors can choose from. Okay, and then finally the sun goes down, you still want the party to continue. That's kind of the most fun because then it's cooler. Yes. What are some things to help us get through the summer nights? So we love lighting, wicker lanterns, string lights are beautiful, but when it comes comes to insects, uh -huh. an insect yes. repelling candle is gonna do double duty as both a source of warm, cozy vibes and a bug repellent. Okay, and you know what we did? We bought one of those giant outdoor fans, which really helps to keep the bugs away as well. Yes, those are a great idea too. I love this wicker lamp. All right, Melanie, what about outdoor movies? That's becoming more and more popular. Backyard movie theaters are so easy to create and they're fun for literally everyone of all ages. All you need are a screen, mm -hmm. a projector, an audio system, a content source, and a few cables and wires. You're like, all you need are these seven things. <laughs> but they're, they're pretty affordable these days, yes? They really are, and aside from the technical aspects, all you want to think about are food, seating, and maybe some mosquito netting. But Definitely. Everyone has fun in a backyard movie theater moment. Melanie Berlier, thank you so much. So appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right, well, that is our time for all of us here at NBC News. I'm Vicki Wynn. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. In the meantime, stay safe and cool. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America with interesting architecture, diverse restaurants and specialty shops. It's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other.
Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. And it's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor and so from Gold Rush, they ended up doing farming, mm -hmm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple rolls of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into, you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. 
we do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, you know, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved Butte, Montana. 
Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They need to have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know. A lot of patrons that have been here, they've told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original and the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over 100 plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens 
and low-income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan, and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age, and if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't. We can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, people are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, uh, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or uh, old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate.
To learn more about the future of Chinese-American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, General Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right, because it's all over the United States. Yeah. So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then They go somewhere else, right. To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly, and then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese-American food, many family-owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of food and wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusion-y and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right. uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. 
Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, Two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Well, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. There's a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the sausage. Chinese sausage, yeah. Whoa. You've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic, and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. Well, hello, hello, welcome to The Boost. We are gonna start your day off with some positivity. So we're gonna share stories that are sure to warm your heart and hopefully leave you with a smile. We start with stories from our special series, Today on the Move, and to kick things off, we tapped a remarkable young man spreading joy in an unlikely place, the subway. So I joined him for an unforgettable day beneath the streets of New York. Check it out. It's a little bit nerve-wracking setting up my board in hand, my bag in the other hand, walking into a platform full of people looking the opposite direction. But then as soon as I set the board down, get my shoes on, the nerves are automatically gone. I'm connecting with the audience. And tap dancer Jaboan Dixon has chosen one of the toughest audiences in the world, the millions of riders of the New York City subway system. In New York, everybody has a mission and somewhere they're going, something to do, someplace to be. So I have to be a dynamic enough part of the city that it makes them want to stop and be like, oh, let me, let me stop and experience this New York experience right now in the moment. But Jaboan's story didn't start in the city of New York. It started in the city of Chicago, where he grew up tap dancing with his family. And then his longtime girlfriend, Nicole, got a part in the Broadway show Six, and he followed her to New York to support her dream while auditioning for his big break as well. My options were a job that you can do like right away, you know, do like a waiter type of thing or like a bartender. Or I was like, I can take my art and bring it straight to the people and see what happens from that. 
And what has happened is something extraordinary. Connections with commuters, shy smiles from children who then jump in to learn, and sometimes, like today, a full-on dance party with a middle school from Houston, Texas. Okay, you know what? I just witnessed some magic. Yeah. I just witnessed some subway yeah. magic. I'm down here bringing the tap to the people. What was going on with you and the crowd? That was the exchange that happens a lot down here. How do you capture someone's attention in all the chaos down here? Just kind of have to be able to connect with them fast enough for them to want to connect with you, you know? This is like a communication without any words. Yeah, You're yeah. Just doing it. That's what tap is, to be honest. It's a conversation, you know? So if I can give you a little rhythm with my feet and that captures you enough, that's, uh, that's the goal right there. And I had a goal myself. I wanted Jaboan to teach me how to make my own magic in the subways. Okay. So I want you to give me two steps, but then we're gonna clap. So it's just like a right, left, stepping both feet and then a clap. Yeah, you know, kind of like a We Will Rock You type of thing, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Soon I was shuffle ball changing as well as, okay, maybe these sweet tourists from Iowa. And the big finish comes what when we put it together. In five, six, seven, eight, step, step, clap, step, step, clap. Shuffle, step, uh, shuffle, step, uh, toe, toe, heel, heel, step, step, step. Yes. And then the bow, though, and then the bow. You gotta finish with a bow, you know? <laughs> By the way, you are so magnificent. Thank you, thank you. You are, you are full of, like, joy and positivity and all the things that are needed everywhere. Even in all the noise underneath the streets of New York City, Jaboan brings the light. Coming up next, Al Roker on the move with bus operators right here in New York City to celebrate the men and women who get us where we need to go. All this while Al was honoring the memory of his father and the job he held for more than 20 years. In the city that never sleeps, the nation's largest bus fleet doesn't either. More than 10,000 city bus operators work transporting New Yorkers across all five boroughs. And the driving lineup includes David Lugo, Louis Jimenez, Bernadine Kamwanya, and Cleveland October. Longtime bus operators in the Big Apple, a job my dad was proud to hold for over two decades. I wore this suit because this was the color of my dad's bus uniform. I mean, he took great pride in it. What is it about being an MTA bus driver that elicits that pride? The responsibilities of the lives mm -hmm. that you have in your hands. Having them people entrust you. I love the people. I love helping people. I like taking people places, mm -hmm. especially the seniors. They say, I was waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find each of these operators doing what they love in different parts of the city. Together, they have nearly 90 years of experience picking up passengers. David works at the Jackie Gleason Depot in Brooklyn. My dad drove out of there as well. When I was off from school, he'd take me on the bus with him. And at the end of his run, you know, we'd be in a parking lot, and he'd let me, let me steer right. the bus, you know. <laughs> I'd sit on, literally sit on his lap, and he'd let me steer the bus. What are the memories you have with your kids on the bus? When they ran all the way to the back and seen how long the bus was. When you first started, you stand next to the bus, and you say, I'm going to drive this. <laughs> <laughs> they would come in. I would wave at people on different stops because they were like, Poppy, everybody knows you. Mm -hmm. I'd be like... This is my route and, you know, this is how I work and it's a, it's a good feeling. There was this two-way street of pride. I was so proud to see my dad mm. doing this and I think he was proud to see me see him doing that. Yes, that's the best. While these operators get to drive buses with air conditioning and even USB charging ports, there isn't the change makers anymore. Thank God. <laughs> The bus I rode on with my dad in the 60s, well, missing just a few upgrades. We got to take a trip down memory lane, thanks to the New York Transit Museum, who takes care of this vintage fleet. So guys, this is the bus I remember riding on with my dad. Oh. I would literally sit over either this seat or this seat. There was a place in Brooklyn uh, called Goody's Luncheonette, mm. and uh, he would get me some yoo-hoos. I'd sit here and I'd see people coming in and, uh, hey, Mr. Roker, and he'd introduce me to his favorite passengers. The passengers, the best part of the job, not only for my dad, but for these proud New Yorkers who wake up every day 
with a passion to serve. You've got regular passengers to the point where if you don't see them for a little bit, is there a concern? Yes, it happens all the time. Especially when you have school kids. And if I don't see them, I wonder. And if the next time I see them, I'm like, what happened to you? Are you okay? I say, okay, as long as you're fine, that's good. How important do you feel your job is to your community? It's important because when emergency comes, we are called and buses don't stop. Whenever it's a situation, we are called upon to go ahead and, and help. In a way, it sounds like your passengers, it's almost like family. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Coming up, a grand tribute to the role of grandmothers, the role they play in our lives, coming up after the break. the boost grandmothers hold a special place in so many families and in hispanic homes the abuela is often the mvp now thanks to social media she is finally getting her time in the spotlight tom yamas has that story there's a new star on social media and let's just say she's old school who uncovered baby jesus He's not supposed to be born yet. Going viral and hitting very close to home for Hispanics. Life is like a butter container. You never know what you're going to get. The character Abuela, which means grandmother in Spanish, is the brainchild of actor and producer Jenny Lorenzo, an homage to her real life Cuban abuela. It's funny because when I would meet my friends' abuelas, I'm like, y'all are the same. What is going on? Abuela's appeal comes from a shared experience. For so many Hispanics, the grandmother plays an integral and daily role in raising the grandkids. A lot of it is just in the facial expressions, um, especially her judgment stare. Yeah. It's just like, you know, just pierced right through your soul. Um, and Abuela is not the only inspiration for laughs. Another handle, Abuela's Counter, is gaining likes by helping followers recreate their grandmother's favorite recipes. So basically, it comes from an idea. We started working together in COVID, just passing recipes together and just trying to keep alive, you know, all the traditions that we that we grew up with. So we're going to fry up some croquetas. Created by some Annie Mezerhain and Cristina and Bustamante, the page shows followers how to cook everything from medianoche sliders to flan, even the perfect cafecito, just like Abuela made it. It's more than a cookbook, it's an experience. A place where people could go and they could sort of connect with their past, but also show their kids and the next generation the culture. Every time I cook now, I just feel like a little piece of her is with me and I can pass that on to my kids. And I think that that's always what she wanted. Ah. With all this love for grandmothers, we thought we would invite over Abuela to Abuela's counter. How does it smell? Does it smell like it's going to be tasting good? Ay, huele riquísimo. Esas niñas, yo sé que sus abuelas le enseñaron cocinar. 
But will you kind of tell them if something's a little too salty, or you, you'll tell them? Sí, yo no tengo pelo con la lengua. Yeah. Sí. <laughs> and it turns out Abuela's counter is Abuela approved. Pressure. No. <laughs> and as the spirit of abuelas, past and present, lives on, so does their responsibilities. Something my own mom, now an abuela herself, shared with me. Do you feel the responsibility of sort of the keeper of the family legend, the keeper of Definitely. the family customs, the keeper of Definitely. all the history from, from Cuba up until now? Definitely. I do. I start instilling the love of Cuba and, and the love of this country that has opened all its doors to respect your country above all and to never forget where you come from. All right, there's nothing like grandma's cooking. And if you have fond memories of yours in the kitchen, we've got a place that will make you feel right at home. Donna Farazin takes us to the Italian restaurant on Staten Island, serving up love in every dish. From the moment I arrived at Enoteca Maria, I knew I was in for a treat. Surrounded by grandmas. I had the honor of meeting premier chefs Maria, Dolly, and Maral. But we are not chefs, we are just grandmothers. But grandmothers are the best chefs. Who say yes. like our culture. You know what they say, grandma knows best. The best of the Right? <laughs> the grandmothers, each from a different country. Maria from Italy, Dolly from Sri Lanka, and Maral from Azerbaijan. What is your favorite dish to make? I make lasagna, I make me bowl, I make rabbit, I make so much fish. The Staten Island Eatery is open for dinner three nights a week. It features a fixed regular Italian menu and a rotating lineup of nonnas, Italian for grandmother, cooking up their culture's cuisine. This is very famous in Sri Lanka for breakfast when they have dinners, parties. They make this. Feeding yeah, people, whether yeah. it's guests or customers, that is, what does that mean to you in your culture? Happy. Happy. Very really happy. And what has it added for you in your life? Friends. Friends. And then happiness. Meeting people. Many times these uh, women are empty nesters. Their husbands have passed away. Uh, the children have moved out. So uh, they're really looking for an outlet, uh, and they have it here. Restaurant owner Jody Scaravella started the project to honor his own Italian heritage and his nonna, mother, and sister, who have all passed away. It was grief-driven. I had no business plan. I had no experience. I never even worked in a restaurant. No idea what I was doing, and uh, so it just kind of unfolded. Jody opened his doors in 2007 and shortly after opened his kitchen to the nonas of the world with rave reviews. Any grandmas with home cooking, it, it appeals to me. I had to get the lasagna because I love Italian food. Everybody, they kiss me, they want to make a photography with me. You know, everybody said, I love you, I'll come again, I want to see you again. Beautiful. And for these nonas, cooking is in their genes. You all learned how to cook from a very young age from your parents. Uh, yeah. My mother always said, do for me, learn for yourself. Uh, you're gonna need this in future. And you're not just doing it for you now, you're doing it for all I, the customers, uh, yeah, for, for everyone everybody. who comes in. My son, they like a cook. And yeah, your son likes my to cook. My son, gonna oh, ask forget about it. Kids. My uh, uh, granddaughter. She was even about three, three years, and she cracked her eggs like professional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, folks, it's very... What do you like today? Yeah. Um, I do lamb stew, dolma. It's good. Dolma! Yeah. My grandma makes dolma! With all the love in the room, I had to get my own Nona on the line. Hi, Ashy! Ashy, I miss you. I miss you so much. I'm with my grandma. I'm a grandma. <laughs> I'm a mom with is you. Maria Vain Maral. Turns out my own Nona and Maral share a common language, Azari. Uh, Madam Maral, this is how all this is. I understand that. I'll see you soon, Ashi Nancy. I love you. 
There are three different cultures, but what do you have in common? Friendship. The frost of Friendship. Love. Friendship, yes. Good food. Good food. Good food. Italian food. We are back on the boost, shining a light on a fisherman who decided to use his kayak as a makeshift garbage truck. And he's built a big following, making a big difference. Here's Joe Fryer. So we're down here at the beautiful Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio. Beautiful. I think she's beautiful, you know, and uh, it's got its problems, but every day we're out here trying to make it even more beautiful. For Eddie Olshansky, the road to beauty runs through water. All right, we're in search of garbage. We sure are navigated by kayak as we comb the river's banks for trash. All right, got my garbage bag. There you go. And how about one of these? Got I my bestow grabber. bestow upon you a grabber. All right. Try not to lose it. Our search does not take long. What do you find in there? We got a beer can, a couple of water bottles, and just some big chunks of styrofoam. For Eddie, this cleanup is more than the occasional volunteer project. As the founder of an organization called Trash Fish, he's out here at least five days a week, and often he's not alone. I feel confident. I feel really motivated and pumped to help the environment out today. With help from social media, Eddie has recruited a school of Trash Fish to help. There's no money in picking up trash, I promise you that. But without us, I think this river system is far worse off. The Cuyahoga has a notorious past known decades ago as the Burning River. It was so polluted with oil and waste, it caught fire more than a dozen times. Such environmental disasters led to the creation of the EPA in 1970 and shortly after the Clean Water Act. While flames are no longer a concern, trash is. You see, the Cuyahoga flows directly into Lake Erie, the water source for about 12 million people. This river, this section of this river, is the last chance we have to stop this stuff before it actually gets into our drinking water. Eddie redirects some of that stuff. 30 pounds of basketballs. To his garage. This is part of some of my collection of what I think is interesting stuff that I've pulled out of the river over the last couple of years. He's found balls, toys, and just a couple years ago, this decades-old Pepsi king. That just tells me that all the plastic that we put in there today is going to be there in 50 years. It's going to be there in 100 years. It's probably going to be there in 1,000 years. He brings these items to his speaking engagements, including these old aerosol cans, which look more like modern art. When stuff like this ends up in the river and it gets punctured, Underwater, all that foam comes out, and this is what it solidifies as. 
The most concerning things he finds, tiny beads of plastic called nurdles. They're the building blocks of almost all plastic products, often confused for food by marine life. Ah, uh, Joe, here's our first nurdle of the day. Oh, you already found a nurdle? Certainly did. It never takes long. We find them all over, even in a plastic soda bottle. What do you think's also in there? Nurdles? There's a bunch of nurdles in here. You got nurdles in there. But like a drop in the ocean, bit by bit, Eddie and his trash fish are making waves by cleaning up the river. How amazed are you by the things you see in the water? Oh, I can't even make up the stuff that we find. Eddie estimates since he started in 2015, they've reeled in nearly 100,000 pounds of trash. I do feel like you're making a difference, and I think everybody does their part that you can chip away at it a little bit. Every bit counts, right? Every bit counts. And that is what keeps Eddie fishing for trash. Does this feel like your life's work now? It sure is at this point. I, I don't think that I intended for it to be when I first started doing this, but if you were out here every day seeing what I see and you knew the people in this community, you'd want to be out here every day too, I think. From one man making an impact to another, meet Zero Waste Daniel. This up and coming designer is making sustainable fashion cool and our girl Donna headed to Brooklyn to meet him. What I specialize in is best night of your life clothes. Don't you wear Zero Waste Daniel and think you're not gonna get stopped on the street. I am sold. I want the <laughs> best night of my life. <laughs> Meet designer Daniel Silverstein, who is taking sustainable fashion to a lively and stylish new level. 150 billion items of clothing are created every year. 60% of our clothing has some sort of form of plastic in it. And fashion is the second largest polluter of clean water in the world. Brands like Zero Waste Daniel are getting it right in the sense that they're thinking about fashion from a really intentional place, from farming the textiles, manufacturing, and to retail as well. While the brand itself is only a decade old, this has been a lifelong passion project for Daniel. Tell me about the first time you fell in love with fashion. I fell in love with fashion at a very young age. I'm also a little brother to an older sister who had a collection of Barbies. After seeing whatever movie or the Olympics or a play, I would come home and remake what I had just seen out of anything in the house. All the tissues, a whole roll of tin foil, and finally, at maybe five years old, my mom said, I will take you to a fabric store. That's really where this all began for me. In school, I saw all of the mountains of scraps being thrown away, and I knew from childhood that there were other end uses for these things. What really worked for my business was breaking into factories, stealing their scraps, and showing people what I could do with it. It makes so much sense that Zero Waste Daniel cut through the noise because it wasn't just another sweat pant line, it was about solving a problem. In addition to his sweats and tees, Daniel's creations range from custom wedding gowns to avant-garde drag costumes. You're telling a story with the process of creating these clothes as well. My happiness doesn't come from my bank account. The happiness is in watching someone's eyes light up when they see their reflection wearing one of these pieces. Watching the light bulb go off over a student's head as they realize they could reinterpret materials in a way that they never thought of before. Then it was time to get scrappy. We're going to cut and sew at the same time. And these little scraps are going to come down the chute and end up in our reuse bin. And we go through this over and over and over. So there really is zero waste. Yeah, I feel like the main thing for me personally is that gratification of knowing that this was something that someone saw as trash and time and energy and expertise turned it into something beautiful. Is there someone that you are dreaming of dressing? Probably the person I would love to see wearing Zero Waste Daniel the most would be like Lil Nas X. You recently had a collaboration with Fran Drescher, who is another fashion icon. That was a really full circle moment for me because I felt like, as a kid, Fran Fine, I felt so much kinship with that character because I was the one wearing the loud outfits in my house. And to be dressing someone who inspired me to express myself through fashion was such an honor. 
While Daniel's relatively small operation has already reached impressive heights, he knows it's just the beginning for his mission. How hopeful are you that future generations will follow in this sustainable clothing lead? When I was a student at the Fashion Institute of Technology, sustainability was a club. Now it's a major at most design schools. So I'm really optimistic that the next generation of designers is being educated to think this way and that the people who discouraged me from pursuing this are retiring. So I'm thinking that the future is pretty bright. Just ahead, we're gonna put a smile on your face with the latest viral video. That's right after the break. the boost we have one more video that is sure to boost your day take a look an Atlanta man named Tito has always considered the University of Georgia his dream school he did not get a chance to go there but he's such a huge fan and he's been supporting the Bulldogs his entire life so when his teen daughter decided she was going to enroll at Georgia she wanted to surprise her dad with the big news so she gave him a Bulldog t-shirt and you can watch what happens thank you babe Tell me you want to join. You want to join? Yeah. You want to join? Yeah. Oh. Oh. oh, that's it. The surprise Batito to tears. Oh, um, my word. That's Can you imagine? Oh. The next best thing, or even maybe the better thing, he's going to be at the football game. Oh, yeah. We're going to look for him in the stadium. Yeah, what she doesn't know is every weekend is going to be parents' weekend. Yeah. Yeah. That'll do it for us for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more of our favorite feel-good stories. So we will see you next time right here on Today All Day. I'm Shop Today Editorial Director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Jovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in influencer trends. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. This is Shop All Day Accessories for All. Hey everyone, I'm Adriana Brock, and we are back today with a new episode of Shop All Day, all about accessories for everybody in the family. Accessories may be small, but they can make a big impact. We've rounded out some of our favorite picks that are instantly gonna upgrade your wardrobe, home, and your life. We've got everything from a simple style solution for your Apple Watch to a chic rattan bag that is a must have for summer. And see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop everything we're sharing with you today. Okay, so if you're in the market for a classic bag that you're gonna use year round, look no further. This LL Bean tote might be as good as it gets for a bag that marries style, 
and utility. The Boat & Tote Open Top Bag is made with a sturdy canvas that can withstand the elements, whether you're on the beach, commuting to work, or traveling. It comes in a bunch of different sizes, so you can choose from regular or long straps too, which is my favorite part, and you can get it monogrammed, so everybody in the family can get their own. And the folks at LLB promise that their bag can hold up to 500 pounds, which sounds crazy, but when these bags came out in about 1944, they were originally used as ice carriers, so they are really built to last. And whether you're toting around your LL Bean bag, your travel bag, or a laptop bag, you're gonna want a Clippa bag hanger. Here is why. Unlike other purse hooks, you won't have to dig around because you keep it on the strap. It is so lightweight, and according to the brand, it is strong enough to hold 33 pounds. And according to the brand, thanks to a thin design and these non-slip foot pads on the ends, you only need half an inch for this to work its magic. That means you can hang your bag off thin edges, ledges, rails, and openings. And you're not limited to a flat surface, and that kind of versatility makes it a must-have for every bag. And whether you're working from home, heading to the office, the Shop Today team loves these puffy laptop sleeves from Bagu. We take our devices on the go everywhere, and the quilted cases actually come in a bunch of different colors, patterns, and three different sizes to cover everything from your tablet to your laptop, even your e-readers. These are amazing as an added layer of protection in your tote bag, in your backpack, and in case of any spills, the brand says that these are machine washable, which is great when you're on the go. And the designs are so cute. Okay, and let's talk about the trend that keeps on getting. I am talking about the fanny pack. It is stylish, functional, and an accessory you'll use nonstop all summer long. Lululemon's best-selling everywhere belt bag came out recently and it became so popular that the brand launched an extended strap size to be more inclusive. It makes it easier to wear however you want, whether it's a classic waist belt, a crossbody, or a shoulder bag style, but the design of the bag itself puts function at the forefront. It has a large zipper, and inside it is so roomy, it has a bunch of pockets so you can keep everything handy and organized. All right, let's talk about a small accessory that can make a big impact, a brand new Apple Watch Band. I love my Apple Watch for tracking steps, activities, and all of those calendar reminders. So when I wanna make it feel new, this chic watch strap is perfect. I feel like I have a brand new watch and it looks great with my outfit and all my jewelry. This band is compatible with all Apple Watch models and you can choose from over 20 different styles. They're all made with a lightweight resin that's gonna keep your watch secure while adding a pop of color to any outfit. Next up, we have an accessory that everybody in the family is going to love. Let's talk baseball caps. You know, the unofficial classic American accessory. The sun shielding hat actually got its humble beginning as a sun visor on the baseball field. And today, it's one of the hottest fashion trends that we can't get enough of. You can always spot an athlete wearing one. The baseball cap is so universal that men and women can wear it every day as part of any casual outfit. This summer, one thing's for sure. The sun is gonna be out and you're gonna need a hat. So consider this affordable Old Navy cap. According to the brand, it is made with durable, 100% cotton twill fabric, and it has a curved visor brim, a fabric covered button at the crown, and those essential air holes. Okay, this next one I am personally excited about because I love this brand. It is the Kitsch Microfiber Towel Scrunchie Set. They're almost like mini towels for your hair, and here's how it works. According to the brand, microfiber material is really soft and tends to dry hair faster while helping to minimize frizz. So the scrunchie acts like a little towel to help absorb excess water. And according to the brand, this is what allows hair to air dry naturally and reduce frizz. They're great for everyday use, but also perfect for summer. You can pop one in your bag to take to the pool or the beach or travel. And now let's finish up by talking about shoes and socks. Yes, socks can make such a difference in comfort. And these are one of my favorite from New Balance. They are great because they are made with a fabric that the brand says offers cooling technology and moisture wicking to keep your feet nice and dry all day long. They come in an athletic low cut style with mesh ventilation that according to the brand is helping to cool and create that airflow. These are great for the whole family. And lastly, we have a wardrobe essential, a classic pair of white sneakers. You can never go wrong with a pair of white sneakers and these knit kicks from Kariuma are a favorite among the whole Shop Today team. They're available for men and women in 17 different colors for under $100. 
The brand says that these eco-friendly sneakers don't just look and feel great. They're made with bamboo, sugarcane, cork, and recycled plastics from heel to toe. But most importantly to us, they're so lightweight, and the brand says they deliver a low impact with every stride, which you need for all-day comfort. Let's go through the products one more time. The L.L. Bean Boat and Tote Bag, the Clippa, the Bagu Puffy Laptop Sleeve, the Lululemon Everywhere Belt Bag, the Resin Apple Watch Band, the Old Navy Baseball Cap, the Kitsch Microfiber Towel Scrunchies, the New Balance Cooling Socks, and the Karyuma Off-White Knit Sneakers. That's it for Editor's Picks. Up next, lifestyle influencer Jasmine Snow is chatting with Mako and Lobu about some of her favorite must-have products to style your weekend and office looks. From backpacks to mules, we've got a lot of great products coming your way. Welcome back. I'm Mako Njovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders, and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products, or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. If anyone knows how to style an outfit, it's our guest today, Jasmine Snow. She's a style expert, and she's here to share her tips and tricks for elevating your look at the office or on the weekend. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, how are you? Oh my gosh, it's been so long. It's been so long, and I'm so excited that we're talking about accessories for all. So here's the number one question. When it comes to shopping for accessories, should I be looking for inexpensive pieces, or should I invest in my accessories? Well, what I always do is I always go for the inexpensive pieces. Here's the thing. I love to change it up, switch it out, change it with every outfit. So you don't want to spend tons and tons of money. And the trends change on the pieces that are classic. If you're going to buy real jewelry, if you're going to like diamonds or something like that, of course, invest. But, you know, really save that for big gifts that you want to ask for. The other trendy stuff, just 
do it where it's really inexpensive, affordable, and you can just have fun with it. And that's the whole idea, having fun. So let's speak about having fun. Can you mix patterns or prints or metals when it comes to accessories? I am all about the mix. I am about the mix on the high low, and I am all about the mix of metals. I think you can mix rose gold, regular gold, silver, gun metal, anything that you want. I think it goes. It is, as long as it works with your outfit and as long as you feel good about it, yeah. go for it. Right? Accessories make your whole outfit pop. You're so right. Let's dive into some of your picks. I'm so excited about these bobble bar hoops that you have here. Now, I see that they got a little sparkle, a little bling to them. Are they more special occasion or can you wear these every day? I love to wear these every day, but I think it's great because you can really dress them up for going out at night, on the weekend. I love that Baba Bar always offers a pack. They take all the work out of it. You don't have to do any of the mixing. Like, I love a good earring stack, and you kind of just don't have to think. It's already done. And when it's affordable like that, you can just mix and match however you want. All right, Jasmine, on to the next one. Some weekend picks. We have the barrettes from Lulu's. As soon as I saw them, I thought, okay, these are great for bridesmaids or a bride, but you can certainly dress these down as well, right? Yes, that was my first instinct. We're coming upon wedding season, and it's a really easy accessory to throw in your hair and kind of dress things up right away. But you can also wear this. I love the idea of wearing it sort of casually on the weekend, but you can dress it up as well to go out at night. I just think it's really cool to just throw in your hair with jeans and a tee, and it kind of just zhuzhes things up. It really does. And I like how you can just clip it into your hair and it's going to stay in place all night long. All right, on to more fun weekend things. This mini bag. Okay, I'm obsessed with this. I love the detail. What would you pair this with? Isn't she so cute? Oh, I love yes. this one. Okay, I would pair this with everything, to be <laughs> completely honest. I love this as a weekend going out bag. Of course, it's a little mini bag, so it's perfect. It's not necessarily a clutch. It's this little top handle. We're seeing these structured bags everywhere. Mini bags are having such a moment right yes. now. But I do really like it for a daytime look too. Again, sort of that same thing as the barrette. If you want to elevate an outfit and you're just in something very casual, go for it with the cute bag. Like, why not? Why not? And I like that you can still fit in your essentials, right? Like my cell phone can fit in here as well if I'm going out for the weekend. If you can fit your phone, like that's the test. If yeah. you can fit your phone in it, you're good. You got everything else. I absolutely love this purse. This is great for the weekend. All right, so, so, so cute. All right, let's move on to items, accessories for the office. I wanna start with the mules. Those would be great for like an everyday staple, right? Exactly, so right now we're all kind of moving from home, from the couch, back to the office. We wanna be comfortable. And this is a great update on the flat and you know, easing your way back into real shoes for the office. It's very professional. But what I love about it is it's got a little jewelry on it. So it's just a little bit of shine on the toe and it just makes things fun. It really is fun. As soon as I saw this, I said, okay, this is great. A transition piece, right? We're in spring right now, but we're going into summer. So, so many different ways that you can style it. Exactly. Like you don't want to wear your big clunky boots right now, but we're not exactly ready for open toe just yet. So it's perfect, you're exactly right. It's the perfect transition shoe. Absolutely, okay, let's move on to this backpack, which is great for the office. Jasmine, I pack my lunch, my magazines, I pack everything into my backpack. Tell me about it. Yeah, so people are really in transition all day long now. Our lives have completely changed. We're going from working in a cafe to home, to an office, to picking up our kids from school. You maybe have your lunch, your computer. So it's really great to have a great big bag that you can put all of that stuff into, but it still is sleek and chic and it looks like it's an actual fashion piece and not just like your old school backpack that you threw on. Absolutely. Can I tell you a secret? I also looked at this. I have a couple of friends that are pregnant and I thought this would be a great like diaper bag. Is that crazy? No, I carry a diaper bag backpack all the time. And it's really nice because then my husband doesn't mind carrying it and it's easy for him to grab too. It's honestly, it is the best diaper bag for moms. It really is. I love a piece that is multifunctional. Speaking of multifunctional, this necklace right here is like the best of both worlds, right? Because you have different designs and detail. Do you wear it as is or would you stack it with other jewelry? 
stacking is kind of my jam. I'm really into tons of gold chains right now. As you can see, I'm really always piling them on. But I think it's really nice to be able to mix your personal pieces in with chunkier, trendier pieces. It does work if you're going to like a wedding or something a little bit more dressy and you need it to be cleaner. It definitely works on its own. Don't get me wrong. You can do that if you'd like. But I just think it's really fun to kind of mix things up, have a little bit of sparkle, have a little bit of chains. And just, again, like do your thing. Whatever it is that you feel good in, go for it. Go for it. And we're talking about accessories for all. I love how this is ageless as well. My mom can wear it. My sister can wear it. I can rock it. This is a great pick. Yeah, and it's accessories for all, but accessories for everything. So you can rack it to work. You can go on the weekend, go out. It really works. It's very multifunctional, like we said. Oh, you are everything. Thank you so much for joining us and dropping these tips about accessories for all. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, you too. All right, now let's run through all the products one more time. We have the bobble bar earring set, the rhinestone barrette, the beaded mini bag, the motor chain mules, the backpack, and the bobble bar necklace. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, Chassie Post is gonna share her favorite accessories in Style Finder. Ooh, I can't wait. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and this episode is all about accessories. I've got some must-have items that will instantly upgrade and elevate your look in a pinch. And remember, see that QR code in the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's start off with one of my absolute favorite trends of the summer, rattan. Rattan is actually the name of a climbing palm vine that can be woven in different styles to give you that fabulous straw basket look that we've seen so much of this season. And I love how the natural woven palm brings an organic and beachy touch to anything you pair it with. I mean, it almost looks like a little picnic basket 
And these great bags go anywhere. Dress them up or down. Where is a crossbody with everything from your bathing suit and a cover up to shorts and a tee? Or dress it up by knotting the strap like a little top handled bag. I love that. And I recently went to a fancy event and I carried a rattan bag and I absolutely loved how it looked with my more formal look. Picnic or to the party, this is such an adorable bag. Now on to one of the hottest sandal trends out there for the summer, the H sandal from The Drop. And this is such a chic and easy option. And it's one of the most popular slides out there for two reasons. Number one, I mean, check out this really cushy footbed, right? so much more comfortable than the average flip-flop. And number two, the style. The H style we have seen absolutely everywhere. And what I think is so great about these is they go with everything. I mean, I love this fabulous metallic and this patent orange, I mean, brights, one of the biggest trends we're seeing this season. And of course, the classic white. I think a great idea is to leave these by the door and no matter where you're going, you slide on into these and you're gonna look chic. So next, we've got a mega trend when it comes to hair accessories today, the claw clip. And yes, as you have probably heard, the 90s are having quite the moment in the fashion and accessories world these days. But these little claw clips from H&M aren't your average 90s throwback. First of all, they come in a set of four, and I think they're so beautiful, actually pretty glamorous, which is not something you hear in relationship with claw clips every day. And what I think makes them so special is these beautiful materials. I mean, we have a faux tortoise shell and even faux mother of pearl and even almost like the great resin Bakelite from the 50s that we've seen so much of out there in accessories this season. And then they're even elevated with little pops of gold. And you can choose between four different colorways here. And they're so easy to use. You just clamp them in. And you can wear them in lots of different ways. I mean, you can wear a couple on one side. I love that. You could wear one on either side, kind of as you would a bobby pin or a barrette. Or go for all four and do a fun 90s inspired updo. On to another accessory trend, jewelry. Now, first up, we've got earrings and juicy fruit is the epitome of summer. And this vitamin C set is as festive as it is fabulous. I mean, believe it or not, fruit has been a big jewelry trend for the past two seasons and I absolutely love it. It's so fresh and fun and I always appreciate an accessory with a sense of humor, right? These are really, really fun. So you can choose between five sets that include all of your favorite fruits. You can choose between sparkly grapes and cherries, lemons, pineapples, bananas, oranges, tangerines, and more. Now you can wear them as a matching pair, right? Or why not mix and match the fruits? You can do a cherry on one ear and a tangerine on the other. Or if you have multiple piercings, you can even look like you've got a glamorous summer fruit basket on your ear. <laughs> and they also make really adorable and affordable gifts. They come in this little gift box and they're great for teens or adults. Next, bracelets. And this sheet collection comes ready for the party. The arm party, that is. <laughs> yes, the layering AK party trend is having quite a moment when it comes to jewelry this season. And we are here for this trend. I love it. You know, more is more, right? So this set comes with four of the moment gold colored bracelets that give that arm party in an instant. It includes two chunky chain bracelets. Yay, I love chains. You guys have heard it here. Chains are a massive trend one pretty cable style bracelet, and one simple classic bangle. So you can wear these all together, or you can wear them on their own, or you can even invite pieces you already own to the party. And don't be afraid to mix and match metals. I love gold and silver and rose gold together. And they have a not to believe price. You get all four for under $10. What a steal. Plus they have a classic look that works with any style. 
now. Over the past few seasons, we've seen a real focus on the waist, and I'm obsessed with these chic wide belts from H&M. They give you that perfect summertime cinch. Plus, they bring in another big trend that we've been seeing, crochet and woven materials. You know those really wide belts and leather that have been so popular, you know, in the fall and winter? Those are great, but they can be really heavy when the temperatures heat up. And I love a big square buckle. This buckle detail you're gonna be seeing absolutely everywhere this summer. And this belt is a little bit over two inches wide and it's made extra long, which I think looks so fabulous hanging down. Or you can always just tuck it in the back for a more tailored look. And I love to use these wider belts to sort of cinch in and give a new look to those oversized shirts that have been such a big trend. Also, a wide belt is really flattering because it cinches in and shows off our waist. And this belt is under $20. So lastly, let's finish up with one of our favorite beauty accessories. And trust me when I tell you, we are not alone in our exuberance for this extensive set. Now this is the BS Mall 14 piece makeup brush set. And it is a serious bestseller with over 96 thousand ratings on Amazon. I mean, that's one of the highest ratings I've ever come across. And here's why shoppers are so obsessed with these. So first of all, you get a comprehensive collection of 14 makeup brushes. That's amazing. That's under a dollar a piece. So you really can apply makeup like a pro because you've got the right tool for the job, which I have found over the years makes a huge difference in my makeup application. And this set comes with everything from eyebrow, eyeshadow, and eyeliner brushes to lip brushes, to blending and contouring and highlighting brushes and more. Plus, they're really pretty. I mean, look at the rose gold. And you know that saying there's an app for that? <laughs> well, with this set, you can be sure that there's a brush for that, no matter the makeup look you're trying to achieve. And lastly, I am such a big fan of this case. Look, it's great for traveling. You put the two pieces together, throw it in your bag. But I also like that you can use it as we've done here. You can break it apart and use it to store your makeup brushes on your counter. And it is always so much easier having all of your brushes right in front of you rather than having to dig through your makeup bag. So let's go through these products one more time and you can use the QR code to get instant access to these items. So we've got the Zara Rattan box shape bag, the drop flat sandal, the H&M hair claws, the vitamin C fruit basket stud earrings, the dainty bracelet set, the braided waist belt, and the 14 piece makeup brush set. And that's a wrap on Style Finder and for our show. It's been fun showing you our favorites. Tune in next week for another episode of Shop All Day. Today all day, up next on Hashtag Cooking, Sama Dada <laughs> is sharing her favorite ways to use up any oats that you have lying around. First up, she's baking an oatmeal chocolate chip cookie that's healthy enough to eat for breakfast. Then, it's homemade granola with a savory twist. If you like oatmeal raisin cookies, I will not judge you. But an oatmeal raisin cookie is simply not a cookie I want to be a part of personally speaking for myself, I will opt for chocolate every single time. I know you have a little canister of oats 
sitting at the back of your pantry that maybe you're neglecting a little bit. But instead of teaching you how to make a traditional bowl of oatmeal, which I already know you know how to make, I'm gonna show you how to hashtag upgrade your oats. Today we're gonna be making my favorite oatmeal chocolate chip cookies with some added fun, coconut, and then a really easy savory granola. How's that for a plot twist? Let's get started. Oats, they are having a moment. They're everywhere these days, and for good reason. Oats are super versatile, they're really nutritious, and there's so much you can do with an oat to make it a star. But there are a lot of different varieties, so I thought I'd walk you through a few of my favorites. Welcome to my kitchen classroom. On today's agenda, Oats 101. These little guys are oat groats. I know, it's not the cutest name, but these are oats in their least processed form. They have a lot of fiber. And these are what they look like before they've been rolled out. They do take a bit longer to cook though, about 30 to 40 minutes, but they have a really nice nutty and chewy texture, which I find is really nice for a salad, similar to a barley or a farro. Next up, we've got my steel cut oats. These are simply oat groats that have been cut into this pinhead shape. Now, steel cut oats take about 20 to 30 minutes to cook. They've got a nice chewy texture, making it perfect for a slow weekend morning when you want to enjoy a bowl of oatmeal. Next up, we have got my oat MVP, rolled oats or old fashioned oats. These oats have been steamed and then rolled out into that iconic oat shape. These take only 10 to 20 minutes to cook, not too long, not too short, but they also have this really nice, springy, light texture without being too chewy. I find that old-fashioned oats are perfect for just about anything. An oatmeal chocolate chip cookie, some granola. I use them so much in my kitchen. And finally, we have our instant oatmeal. These are the most processed form of oats from our little line up here, and what you commonly find in a little brown packet destined for your microwave. These are very mushy in texture, so I don't really cook with them or bake with them. But if you only have about one to three minutes in the morning to cook them, these are the oats for you. I won't judge you if you use them. When you're always stocked with oats, guess what you'll never run out of? Oat milk. Because that's right, you can make it yourself. And I'm gonna show you how to do it. All you need to make your own oat milk at home is some old fashioned oats, some cold water, and a good quality nut milk bag. When you're making your own oat milk, make sure to use old fashioned oats. Steel cut is gonna be a little bit too coarse and instant is gonna be too mushy. So we don't wanna do that. Now, I'm just gonna grab a measuring cup for my old fashioned oats and measure some out. Old fashioned oats secured. My blender is my BFF and this oat milk comes together just in your blender. I'm gonna add my old fashioned oats to my blender. We've got some cold water, make sure it's cold. We don't want any warm water here because the oats will get slimy. Nobody likes a slimy oat milk. Adding this in my blender. And finally, this is optional, but not if you're me, because I like a little touch of sweetness, a little bit of maple syrup. You can totally use a couple medjool dates too, if you'd prefer. Just a touch. You can even add a little dash of cinnamon too if you're feeling like you want to live on the edge today with your oat milk. Now, all I'm going to do is blend it. Only 30 to 40 seconds. We don't want to over blend it because the oats will get kind of mushy. Okay, here we go. Oat milk is in our future. We're looking nice and creamy. Now, before I remove this from the blender, just want to show you. You can totally use a cheesecloth to strain, but I'm using a nut milk bag because it's a lot easier. I'm gonna prepare this in my pitcher. Now I'm just gonna pour in my oat milk. We're making oat milk. You just wanna squeeze it a little bit so you get all of that oat milk out. This is precious, we worked hard for this. Okay, we didn't really work that hard for this, but we still wanna get everything out. Look at how creamy that looks too. Like that's some thick oat milk, I love it. And look at how this nut milk bag is catching all of those little pieces of oats. We don't want that in our oat milk. We want that to stay secure in the bag. 
That's why it's nice to get a good quality nut milk bag because then it makes it super easy to make your oat milk at home. All right, we're gonna set this aside. See you later. And now we have homemade, creamy, delicious oat milk. This stores well in the fridge for about five days. Make sure you stir it before you drink it because separation is totally normal. I like to use this oat milk in any recipe where I call for a non-dairy milk, whether that be in my chocolate chip cookie pie or even my date crumble bars. So delicious, so creamy, it's even amazing in your coffee. And you know what pairs really well with oat milk? Cookies. Luckily, I've got myself covered because we're gonna make my chocolate chip oatmeal cookies with a little bit of coconut. I'm gonna let this chill while I go grab the ingredients. I have been there and done that with traditional stovetop oatmeal and overnight oats. Plus, I would choose a cookie over those two any day. So to solve my persistent desire for cookies at all hours of the day, I'm gonna show you how to make my favorite oatmeal chocolate chip cookie that's wholesome enough to eat for breakfast. So let's get to it. I preheated my oven to 350 degrees and because I love being prepared, I have also lined my pan with some parchment paper. Now we're gonna get to work on the wet ingredients. I'm gonna crack my egg in my bowl. Whisk that really nicely. We want no separation between the yolks and the whites. Okay. This looks great. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of almond butter. Mixing the egg and the almond butter together really well. All right, this looks smooth and creamy. Now I'm going in with my melted and cooled coconut oil. Straight in there. We are actually going to be adding some shredded coconut into these cookies, so I find that the coconut oil really complements that super well. It's also a nice butter replacement in these cookies too. Mixing everything together. Everyone needs to become friendly. Perfect. Now I'm gonna add some vanilla extract. Can't have my cookies without it. And finally, for my sweeteners, maple going in. Maple adds that really warm and almost breakfasty taste to these cookies. And then we're adding some coconut sugar. Coconut sugar and maple syrup are my favorite sweeteners to use together. I find that they complement each other really well. They create this really golden taste in these cookies. Because coconut sugar is really fragrant, it's gonna go really nicely with that coconut oil and that shredded coconut that we're gonna be adding into the cookies later. My wet mixture looks perfect, honestly. I have to give credit to myself. Now, I'm gonna move on to my dry ingredients. For these cookies, I'm using a combination of almond flour and oat flour. If you don't know what oat flour is, get ready to have your mind blown. 
All it is, is just oats ground up into a blender until you get that fine powder, like a flour. Then we get oat flour. How fun and convenient is that? Easy to make at home, you can also buy it from the store. Oat flour going in. We're having an oat moment with these cookies. We love oats. Gonna also add some almond flour. Almond flour is really dense, oat flour is really light, so I find that they create a really nice combination and a really nice texture in these cookies. Okay, we're gonna whisk that up. Whisking our almond flour and our oat flour together really nicely. And now, because I'm fun, I'm gonna add some shredded coconut. Make sure you buy unsweetened shredded coconut because we've got the sugar already, we don't need to add more into our coconut. Now, for our star, these would not be oatmeal chocolate chip cookies without some oats. So, I'm using old-fashioned or rolled oats here. Oats going in. Time for a little baking powder. And a little pinch of salt. The salt is gonna balance out the sweetness, really bring it out, it's gonna heighten all of those flavors. Whisking everything together nicely, we want a fully incorporated dry ingredient mixture here. Dry mixture taking a journey. Beautiful. I'm gonna fold my dry and wet ingredients together until everyone is fully incorporated. So we wanna make sure we're not seeing any remnants of that flour mixture, right? We want it to be fully incorporated. You'll see how that color changes. Everyone looks really nicely incorporated, really well mixed, thorough. We wanna do a thorough job here. I mean, listen, this is like this is like a bowl of oatmeal, right? This counts, a cookie, an oatmeal cookie, same thing. Okay, this is controversial. I'm gonna put my spatula down for this. If you like oatmeal raisin cookies, I will not judge you, but an oatmeal raisin cookie is simply not a cookie I want to be a part of, personally, speaking for myself. Um, I will opt for chocolate every single time. So, I'm gonna fold in some chocolate chips. I measure chocolate chips with my sole, as you can see. I will be saving these to top the cookies with before they go into the oven. I want a few more. I changed my mind. Just a few. Breakfast, anyone? <laughs> okay, we're gonna fold the chocolate in really nicely. And this is a beautiful cookie dough situation I've got here. Okay. Time to make our cookies. Perfect. I'm using a cookie scoop here just to get some nice, even cookies. Want them all to be about the same size and then they're gonna cook evenly too. That is a huge chunk of chocolate chips I just got. I'm not mad about it at all. Okay. And I'm just gonna use my fingers just to flatten them down slightly. Not too much, just a little. This one has so many chocolate chips, that's the one I'm going for. I already know this. I've already made up my mind. I like making these cookies at the start of the week because I'm eating them for breakfast. It's kind of nice to have on hand. And even if you have a different breakfast, okay? Even if you're having your eggs or whatever else you eat for breakfast, you can totally have one of these after with a little cup of coffee. How does that sound? Pretty good. I know, because I do it all the time. You know what these remind me of also? Just like a really glam granola bar. Like a granola bar, but like make it a cookie. I've got some extra dough here. I will be baking these off later, but I do want to add a couple extra chocolate chips on top for fun. I went pretty heavy on the chocolate chips and the dough already. And I honestly love that for me. I'm gonna bake these in the oven 10 to 15 minutes until it's nice and golden brown around those edges. I'm so excited to have some oatmeal breakfast cookies after this.
cookies for breakfast, anyone? I mean, look at how textured they are, right? They've got the oats, they've got the chocolate chips, they've got coconut. There's a lot going on here. Perfect for breakfast, but also for any time of the day. I'm not gonna you know, say that I can't have this after dinner, because I can. So excited to eat them. And you know what I'm gonna eat them with? Some homemade oat milk, because I'm having an oat moment today. And I'm just gonna have all of the oats. I mean, look at that. So fluffy. You know what this needs? You know what this needs? It needs to be dunked in some oat milk. It just has to happen. Okay. I gotta get my camera out first because this is a perfect photo op. All right, it's taking the plunge. <gasps> oh my God, okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'm so good, I'm just losing cookies everywhere. Okay, I need a sip of oat milk. You might, and no disrespect to your bowl of oatmeal, but you might want to abandon it after you try these cookies. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm being honest, I'm being honest. I'm going in for more. Mmm. Someone hold me back. No, really, someone hold me back. Oh, you thought I was done helping you upgrade your oats? Well, you are mistaken because up next, I have my plot twist savory granola. I'm super excited to make it. I'm gonna go grab the ingredients. When you think of granola, you're probably thinking of those sweet clusters of nuts and oats to top your yogurt. But have you ever thought about a savory version? I know it's a plot twist, but savory granola is one of my favorite snacks. I was inspired to make it by traditional Indian snack mixes, and I cannot wait for you to try it. We want the savory granola to have lots of flavor, so to start, we're gonna make a little olive oil spice mixture. In my bowl, I'm gonna add some extra virgin olive oil, Olive oil is gonna help us get that nice, crisp, golden color and texture that we really want. Now, for some more flavor, I'm gonna add some coconut aminos. Coconut aminos going straight in there. Coconut aminos are made from the sap of coconut palms, and it's actually very similar in taste to a soy sauce, but it's gluten-free, so if that's important to you, there you go. We always have to have spice. I always have to have spice. I can't live my life without it. So we're gonna add a couple of my favorites. Cayenne. Cayenne is gonna add some heat, some spice. It's gonna really kick this flavor up a notch. Now I'm gonna add some garam masala. The garam masala is a very common Indian spice blend. It contains pepper, cumin, cloves. It's super warming, super fragrant. I love using it in my savory granola. 
Gonna add a little pinch of salt. Nothing is complete without a little pinch of salt. And now because we have a lot of spice, a lot of flavor, a lot of savory elements going on here, I wanna add a little bit of honey just to balance out that saltiness. I love honey. Just a touch, not too much. That honey is gonna give that really nice, sweet and salty balance that I love so much. Now let's whisk everything together. Make sure it's really well incorporated. We want all of the spice, all of the flavor to be evenly, evenly whisked together. It's pretty potent. <laughs> all right, this is nice and well mixed. Now I'm gonna move on to my dry ingredients. I like using a variety of nuts and seeds here because it's really fun to play with different texture and flavor. Every single nut and seed has a different flavor profile, so it's fun to add them all together and just have a little crunch, a little texture, something different in every bite. So, I'm gonna start with my sliced almonds. I use almonds so much in my kitchen, from almond butter to raw almonds. They're super versatile and I just love the taste. I'm gonna add some raw cashews, super buttery and delicious. Now, we're gonna go for some pecans. Pecan, pecan? I say pecan. In there. I'm gonna add some pumpkin seeds. You can add sunflower seeds here too if pumpkin's not your jam. Pumpkin seeds add that nice green color too. It's kind of pretty. Okay, now we're gonna add some sesame seeds. These are gonna be so delicious when they're nice and toasty in the oven. Mm, I love it. Now, this wouldn't be granola without oats. You cannot have granola without our oats. Adding the oats straight into my mixture. Now we mix them all together. Make sure that you're using raw, unsalted nuts here. We are gonna be roasting them in the oven with some olive oil and spices, so you don't need to buy roasted and salted nuts. Look at how fun and textured this is. So many different colors. And it's about to get a lot of flavor. Time to add my olive oil mixture straight on top of my nuts, seeds, and oats. Leave no spice left behind. Come on, you can do it. Okay. Now we're gonna mix everything together. We want a very well-spiced, savory granola. So every piece has to be coated by some olive oil and spice. It already starts to smell so good, so flavorful. This is such a fun and easy portable snack too. We are looking nice and well mixed. Now it's time for the pan. Make sure you get all of those little resistant oats. They'll have a better life as savory granola. Okay, make sure that you're spreading your granola out really well, really evenly. We want everyone to have personal space, some room to breathe. This way we can ensure a nice and even crisp bake. We are ready for the oven. I'm gonna bake this 45 to 50 minutes at 325 degrees in the oven. Make sure you toss it every 10 minutes or so to ensure that it gets nice and golden brown. Look at my gorgeous golden savory granola. I've let this cool completely. Make sure you let it cool for at least 15 minutes. First of all, it's a little bit too hot to handle as it comes out of the oven. And when you cool granola, it crisps up as it cools. I'm gonna store this in my cute little container, which I promise I can get the lid off because I'm strong. There we go. I love to store these in little mason jars or little jars like this, just so it's nice to have a snack on hand. So the next time you are craving a potato chip or a cracker, this is just a more unique and fun, savory snack to snack on. You've got a lot of different flavors. You can customize it with your favorite nuts and seeds as well. So whatever you have in the pantry, you've got some sunflower seeds, you've got some walnuts, feel free to sub that in. Look at that nice golden color. So good. I've got most of my savory granola into my little jar. And you know what I also like to do with this? 
I like to put it on a salad. Think of this as the fun cousin to your croutons. Yeah, they're your, your crouton cousins. Crunchy, savory, really pretty. You've got those nuts and seeds and you've also got a lot of flavor there. Look how nice that looks. This is a super simple salad. I just did a little bit of olive oil, lemon juice, salt and pepper. This granola though, it adds a secret touch. Mmm! It's so good. It's so salty, but it's got heat and flavor. Wait, I need more. Like, you've got so many things going on, right? Different nuts and seeds. Gives it a lot more texture. Makes it more interesting to eat. You've got something new in every bite. I mean, have you ever seen a salad topped with granola before? I think I have to document it. I mean, look at that, it looks so pretty. Croutons? I don't know you. I mean, come on. I'm obsessed, I'm obsessed. Sweet granola, I'm coming for you. I hope this has inspired you to upgrade your oats. If you're neglecting them in your pantry, let them live, let them live as savory granola, as some delicious oatmeal cookies. Oats are really an MVP. Good Thursday morning. Millions waking up to damage from severe weather. And Al says the threat is not over yet. It's June the 15th. This is today. Storm zone. Tornado sirens blaring across the south. At least 10 touching down in 